welcome. Oops. I, if I could I uh, call the meeting to order and ask for an acceptance of the agenda. So moved. Moved by Second. Ms. Curran. Second by Mr. Bagnani. All in favor? Aye. 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 Or nothing, motion carries. Uh, do I see any walk-ins tonight? We all know what a walk-in is. All right. No walk-ins tonight. Uh, now we have the report of the town administrator, Jim Boudreau. Uh, good evening. Sorry if this is redundant because we just did most of this this morning, but uh, we'll go through it again. Uh, it's a lot of good news, Jim. There's a lot of stuff going on. We have actually a lot of new stuff this week that, that we haven't talked about. So uh, we'll start happened? with the regular stuff. I won't spend too much time on the water update because the water department will do some updates later. Uh, but we are still working on Old Oak and Bucket. We're doing the services now. As soon as that project is finally done, the crew will move to Brook Street and replace the water lines from front to Tilden, then slightly down Tilden for a little bit. So that's ongoing. Uh, I believe they're designing these small single streets now, start getting those done. Uh, but Old Oak and Bucket should be finished shortly. And once it's done, we will pave Old Oak and Bucket Road uh, for the entire length of that project. Uh, water demand was down again last week, down almost 100,000 gallons a day to 1.317 million gallons. Uh, the manganese levels are slowly dropping in the reservoir. Uh, they are still high enough, though, to cause discolored water. The reservoir, the treatment plant does not treat for iron and manganese, so that will cause discolored water. The reservoir at TAC Factory right now is at 5.5 plus inches. Um, I don't think anybody can remember a September where we had that much water in the reservoir which always leads to the question, why do we have a water ban? Uh, people just need to know the water ban that is in place right now is a state-imposed water ban as it imposed on all the communities in our catch basin that would withdraw water from that uh, aquifer, so that is not us. Our water bans go into effect as our water usage goes up, but the state water ban is regardless of how much water you have, how much you're using, goes into effect May 1st every year, and that is the water ban we are currently under. Uh, the treatment plant, Kevin will touch this uh, quick, uh, briefly about the new treatment plant. We're in week five out of seven for the pilot program for the new water treatment plant. Uh, COVID cases uh, jumped to 29 this week from 17 the week before. Um, two weeks before that, we were in the mid-20s, so we're kind of in that teen to high 20 range. Uh, but our positivity rating over the last 14 days actually went down slightly, 2.83 down from 3.06. So you can see those numbers are kind of in conflict. The state number is also down, uh, 2.43 from 2.75, but the county number is up. The county number is up to 3.9 from 3.55. So the numbers are kind of all over the place. Uh, as we've said, we will continue to monitor those uh, numbers. The Board of Health does have the ability to put a mask mandate in place for town buildings or for all public spaces in the town. But until we see that number continually rise on a regular basis, we will just monitor at this point and see where it goes. Uh, we are waiting for guidance on the Moderna and Pfizer booster shots. We have not received that yet. Once we get it, we will pass that along. Uh, first parish work is continuing. If you go up there now, you can see the sidewalk. Uh, they're getting close to finishing the sidewalk. The new granite curbing looks fantastic. Uh, I think the new sidewalk that we'll be doing from the Senior Center across First Parish to connect to Central, uh, Central Park will be fantastic. It'll connect the seniors, it'll connect the library and the Central Park Fields to the Senior Center, the Food Pantry and Recreation. Uh, we started final paving today on Jefferson Lane, Washington Lane, Clifton Ave, and Thomas Ave. Uh, those should be finished up either today or over the next couple of days. And I'll just remind people, uh, Old Oak and Bucket and First Parish, when that paving is done, uh, as paving completes, speeds tend to go up. We will be doing intensive traffic enforcement in both those areas when the paving is done. So when you see the paving trucks, you better start slowing down. Uh, Stephen and Rink renovations continue. If you go over there now, you'll see that the boards have arrived. They arrived today. They'll start installing those tomorrow. The surface is down. Uh, we are asking people, you need to stay out of that area. It is a construction zone. Uh, we've actually, the contractor has padlocked the construction fence to the tennis court fence to keep the people from coming off uh, the uh, skate park. And they're still coming in. I went over there. Kevin was over there earlier tonight. There was probably a dozen people on it. Um, they refused to leave when they were asked to, so uh, we actually called the cruiser to get them out of there. It is a construction area. You should not be in there. As nice as it looks, as good as it looks, please stay out of there till we're done. Uh, so the boards will start going up tomorrow. It'll take about a week. Uh, the final coating should go down after that. There may be a delay on the final coating. Uh, we are having an issue in the town with getting out thermoplastic for the lines on the streets because of COVID and because of the 
power losses in the ice storms in Texas last winter. That's where all that thermoplastic comes from. The same supplier does the surface for the rink, so there could be a delay in getting that surface, but we'll get that down as quickly as we can. We've put in place restrictions on the contractors so they don't interfere with the opening and closing of schools during the day, uh, but we are still on schedule to finish that uh, by the end of the month. It's probably going to be pushed on to October, I think, by the time we finish. Uh, if you get on Tech Factory Pond, Well 17A, uh, everything's in and up. We are doing the testing now. Once we finish testing all the equipment, we'll bring in DEP uh, to get signed off. That returns 225 to 250,000 gallons of water a day back into the system with no iron, with no manganese, which, as everybody knows, is the cause of our brown water. So that is very good news. Uh, Widow's Walk is ongoing. Uh, you get on there now, again, the parking lot's paved. The building envelope is kind of up. You can see what it's going to look like. Uh, they're working on the drainage now. Uh, the well 17, uh, 18, sorry, the well 18 project is just about completed. Uh, when we backwash the filters on well 18B, that backwash has a lot of iron and manganese in it. We will pump that over to the golf course. It'll go to a sediment tank. The iron and manganese will settle out, and then that water will be able to be used to irrigate the golf course. Uh, possibly up to 10,000 gallons a day we could be putting out there. So that's good news for the golf course, and it's better than just putting that water away to waste. Um, I think that's just about done, Kev, that project, so that's pretty good. Uh, if you go on to Hammer Rock, the living quarters on the fire station are all framed, and most of the windows are in, so the living quarters are progressing. The apparatus bay, the walls are going up this week. We expect the roof trusses to come in and start being put up next week. We are still on schedule and on budget down there. Uh, it will be tight, but we will have everything buttoned up in time to get that truck back into the station with the firefighters before the cold weather. So if you get down there, you see that that's ongoing. Uh, reminded of people that the lifeguards are now off all our beaches. Hamarok was the last one, so there are no lifeguards on the beaches. Uh, so if you go to the beaches, you need to use a lot more caution, uh, especially this week. Uh, Hurricane Larry. Um, sorry, I just laugh whenever I say Hurricane Larry. It doesn't seem like the name of a hurricane. No, uh, early. Anyway. Uh, yeah, the rest of the stooges on here. Uh, Hurricane Larry is in the Atlantic right now. It is a Category 3 storm, which is a pretty good storm. It is not expected to impact us directly, but starting <coughs> tomorrow into Thursday and Friday, we are expecting to see increased surf on our beaches, probably some erosion, and the possibility for rip currents. So if you do go to the beaches, uh, please use extra caution in the next couple of days. There are no lifeguards, and we will see some impacts from Larry. If those impacts seem to be getting greater, we will put out additional notices over the next couple of days. Uh, Council on Aging kicked off their lunch program on Thursday. We had almost 90 seniors there for a baked uh, barbecue chicken lunch. Barbecue chicken, corn of the cob, potato salad, followed by a strawberry shortcake dessert with coffee. It was amazing. The place was packed. People had a great time. Uh, the food, I understand, was fantastic. I didn't try it, um, but I did help serve and talk to a lot of the residents. And exactly what I think this board envisioned when we started talking about building that and building, building it. Really just seniors coming together, really enjoying each other's company, having a great time, getting a meal. The meals are $5, uh, so they're very inexpensive. Every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at noontime is lunch. Uh, you're asked to sign up two days in advance by calling into the Council on Aging at 781-545-8722. Uh, and then press zero. The menus are on the website, but for the rest of this week, uh, tomorrow is uh, baked pasta with chicken and a crumb topping with fresh buttered broccoli and garlic bread. And Thursday is meatloaf with mushroom gravy, green beans, parsnip mashed potatoes, a roll and butter. Uh, it is really, I hope the board gets a chance to go up there and, and see one of the meals. For five bucks, you can't beat it. And it was just, it was so great to see so many people just enjoying each other's company and, and hanging out and talking really exactly what you planned when we built this thing so uh kudos to linda and her staff and the volunteers for getting that up and running and i hope the seniors enjoy uh, the new setup up there because it really is fantastic cedar point the contract is back out of cedar point this week we're doing some drainage we're raising the castings once that's done we'll be back to pave cedar point the plan is to pave cedar point now before the cold weather that will be dependent upon the availability of the paving contractor but we are fairly Hopeful that we'll be able to get him out there weather dependent, wrap that up this winter and finish that project. Uh, today is Rosh Hashanah, so we want to wish all our friends of the Jewish faith a happy new year. It started last night. It goes to uh, 
tomorrow evening. So if you have any friends who practice the Jewish religion, Happy New Year. I wasn't able to find out exactly what year it is, but uh, Happy New Year to all those celebrating. Uh, for the board, I think we let everybody know that we've finished the Chief Justice Cushing Highway land purchase. The land on the right side as you head towards Marshfield from Old Forge down to the reservoir. We finished that purchase. That land is now ours. It's a general use, so the board will be able to determine what we're going to do with that. It is a place we're looking for a new water treatment plant, uh, but we will update you as that comes on later on. Uh, the land in Situate Harbor, we are still waiting to close on that. Uh, that land is issued with some of the heirs. Uh, they keep dying, for lack of a better way of putting it, and we have to chase down the heirs of the heirs, but we are getting close on that, and we have not yet closed on the Mordecai Lincoln property in North Situate. The town is trying to get that closed, but we just haven't been able to get the uh, owners of that to come down and finally close on that property. So we'll continue to work on that. Uh, last but not least, uh, believe it or not, school starts tomorrow. So we want to wish uh, Superintendent Burkhead, his staff, and all the teachers and students to have a good year, uh, hoping it's a great year. But we want to remind people that the opening of school means return to students on the roads and on the buses, so you'll see students walking, you'll see them by the side of the road waiting for their bus. Uh, we ask people to be extra cautious with those people on the roads. Uh, there will be a lot of kids walking and by the side of the roads. And I also remind you that passing a stopped school bus with lights flashing is not only dangerous, it is illegal, and the police will be keeping an eye out for that. So uh, please be extra cautious over the next couple of days as the students start returning to school uh, in the new school year. And that's what I have for today. Thank you. No? I have one. Jim, the crosswalk by the Senior Center, when that is repainted, you know, to go across, will that also have an electronic system, like lit system? Not alerting? at this point. No. Not at this point, no. We might want to take a look at that, though, down the road. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll see come on how much. There is plenty of sight line where the crosswalk is going to be. It can be seen from both directions. It's just a little bit on this side of the crest. Yeah. Uh, but there's plenty of sight line down uh, First Parish and Beaver Dam. So I don't know if it's necessary, but it's something we'll monitor. But if you put one of those lights there, it does tend to annoy uh, the neighbors and the abutters. So it's something we'll have to keep in mind. But not at this point. I just think it'll give the seniors a lot of comfort to know that there's some extra safety precautions there. Just I think we need to put it on our list. Um, and then my other question was, do they anticipate 90 people every lunchtime, or do you think that I don't think they're anticipating that many. I think this is okay. just a kickoff. That's great. Um, I think part of it's also going to be dependent upon the menu. Yeah, true that. <laughs> but the menu is <laughs> online. If you go to the town's website, go to the Council on Aging webpage, it's on there, or in the new newsletter that the Council on Aging sent out on the calendar, there's a lunch every week. So, um, but, you know, really it was, it was fantastic to see everybody there. Yeah. Andrew? Good. Okay. I have a couple. Uh, speaking of the Senior Center, when you go to their website, all you have are old pictures of the old Senior Center. I have new ones. Really like nice if we had new pictures of the new facility. Yeah, and I know she's working with Google because when you do Google, it still sends you to the old one, and we're trying to get Google to update. That's all you can find um, is the old one. The old one. We can I just mean, tear it down. It, it's... <laughs> It's been months now, so. <laughs> yeah, okay, we can get on that, yeah. We could get a new website with new pictures. Um, school traffic. School starts tomorrow. Is there going to be the chaos out there tomorrow afternoon? Drop-off doesn't seem to be as bad as pickup. And as you and I talked about earlier in the week, people people go everywhere. They, okay. they don't follow the rules. They don't, they, it's really bad. It has been bad. I think drop-off is as bad as pickup. It's just it not as not. long a duration uh, because they come all at the same time. So there will be traffic. Last year it backed up First Parish uh, to the funeral home a couple times. Um, so it gets bad in the morning, but it's quicker. It is uh, In quicker. the afternoon, people tend to get here very early. They park all over the place. They park out uh, front here. They park going both ways. They, it's, it's terrible. We had, the, we had the police kicking them out of here last year. We'll continue to do that, monitor that. There will be detail offices here. Uh, the schools are working on a plan to <coughs> try to increase some stacking lanes over there. Um, I'm ask, I've asked for a copy of the plan. I haven't got it yet, but they're working with the planning board on that to maybe have some more room for people to fit. Uh, and I think the other thing we're hoping to see is that more kids will be on the bus. Uh, last year, with the restrictions on the bus, with the COVID, 
a lot of parents drove, so I think there'll be more kids on the bus, but it's going to be a work in progress for the first couple of weeks. All right. Well, I just want to express the concern that some people have about what it's like out there in the afternoons. And finally, I would like to say that Cedar Point, I think we now can say, went very well. And so much could have gone wrong out there. So, some stuff in our control, some stuff not in our control. Everything seemed to have worked well. And I just want to say to DPW, to, to the town administrator, to everyone who worked on that, that it was not without its controversy, as we all know, but it's done. It's done well. I believe it came in on budget, if not under budget. And it's working, and hopefully we'll see the results of the I&I &I as a result of it. So yeah, thank we're def you. definitely seeing I&I &I better. Uh, and, you know, the congratulations goes to Kevin and his staff and the school <coughs> department. Um, but, you know, as I reported before, we found laterals that weren't connected. We found laterals that were crushed. We found laterals that were connected with duct tape. Uh, and that, that's all huge sources of I&I. &I. So it will take a little while to model over time what the actual savings are, but we think they're... They're great. They're actually higher than we anticipated. And I think when it's done, uh, it's going to look, Cedar Point will look fantastic. With the new road uh, and with the water and so on. So I think it, it came out very well. And again, uh, Will and his department, Kevin and his guys and the engineers, and the consulting engineer did a fantastic job out there. Well, because we always hear about what goes wrong. And when something goes really well, I just want to say thank you. So if anyone Can else. Can I just add one thing on Karen's point about the. Um, traffic tomorrow, Jim. I know there's usually a police officer over here. Is there any way to get somebody out here for 20 minutes? We I mean, it's literally 20 minutes of chaos. Yeah, if, if we can't get a detail, usually they'll pull one of the road guys off, but there are usually people at both ends. At least the first couple of days. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, on to the next agenda item, which is Discuss Vote Untold Brewery 4th Anniversary Event. Four years, I can't believe it. Are you Matt? Yes. Come on up. Congratulations. Thank you. Four years. Yeah. A couple of them sort of tough. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, last year. And the event is on 10-2-21, uh, the 2nd of October, from noontime to 10 p.m. And this is Matt Elder. And Matt, if you'd like to tell us what you're planning. and. Yeah, so we're pretty much going to try to follow the same blueprint we have the last, well, not last year, but the previous two years. Uh, we'd like to you know, close off the parking lot and allow our customers to wander about the parking lot, uh, listen to live music. We are getting a food truck so they can have something to eat. We'll set up tables and chairs. It's basically going to be a larger extension of our tap room. We'll serve you know, all our beer um, and hopefully just have some people over to enjoy the day with us. Hopefully get some good weather. Uh, the last two years have been a little drizzly, but third time's a charm and uh, we are going to encourage everyone to park up at the MBTA parking lot. Uh, that's what we've utilized the last couple of years and it's been fine. It's a three minute walk down Stockbridge. Um, is that parking lot still available? The lower lot doing is. A yeah, not the upper lot anymore, but the, okay, the lower so lot. The lower, the lower lower or the middle the, or the upper. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, as you're heading towards Driftway on the right. Near the train. Yeah, near the okay. train. Near the, near right. the train, correct. Um, so we've done that the past couple of years, and that's worked really well. And the MBTA doesn't have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. No. It's, yeah. No one parks there on the weekends anyway, really. So there's lots of spots available. And it's usually a couple dozen cars at a time. Everyone's good about carpooling. Um, we'll put up no parking signs, uh, which we've done already a couple times this year for other events for our neighbor's sake, to keep our neighbors happy, which keeps us happy. Um, have three bands playing throughout the day uh, at the back of the parking lot so usually people stay towards that end of the of the parking lot instead of up by the street and food truck will be there all day as well so that's been the blueprint we followed the last few years and it's worked really well so it isn't broken we're not trying to fix it oh no I just want to say congratulations and Matt I you know you've got it down you had everything in there and I appreciate all the tips um, certifications that you included so I don't have any issues I think we've covered a lot of the different concerns over the years and he's continued to address them so congratulations thank you very questions. much appreciate it Andrew? Yeah, I have no concerns either I mean past success no major issue so cheers great thank you 
Tony? Yeah, I mean, my biggest concern is the parking, and if you keep that under control, then that's good. You know, people will just park right on all the way down to the to bridge there, so, and that makes the country way very narrow there on that turn, so. Exactly. If you can put cones or something out there, so yeah, people we'll have cones, yeah. parking signs. We I did not mention we will also have a police detail. Um, right, so they'll there as well. So that yeah. usually helps keep people uh, well right. behaved. So, like everybody else, congratulations on your on your success. I mean, it's it's pretty remarkable when you came before us probably five years ago to start this whole thing. Remember, yeah. You're in every restaurant that I go to on the South Shore, and um, and you've got a great following, and you're really you're really a, probably only met your expectations, but I think you exceeded all of ours. So. So congratulations. Means a lot. And yeah. a beautiful graphic artist. So whoever that is, I hope, you're, I hope you're submitting some of your can designs to some kind of award. It's got to be some craft beer design award because they're, they're yeah. beautiful. This, this Friday actually is the Great American Beer Festival Awards. We've submitted some beers to that. Oh, kind of excellent. Like, you know, Olympics okay. of beer competition. So. Good. Fingers good. crossed. Good luck. Yeah. Let's yeah. Very good. Anyone in the audience have any questions? No? All right. We have two votes, one's for an outdoor entertainment permit and one is for a one day wine and malt beverage license. So if someone would like to make a motion. Sure. Uh, move to approve an outdoor entertainment permit to Matt Elder Untold Brewing, 6 Old Country Way for a special event on October 2nd, 2021 from 12 p.m. until 10 p.m. Second. Do we need the three bands to provide live music? Oh, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm looking at oh. the back of the motion. Sorry about that. Um, moved by Mr. Goodrich, second by Ms. Curran. All in favor? Aye. 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 For nothing, motion carries. Very good. Next. Move, move to approve a one-day wine and malt beverage license to Matt Elder and Toll Brewing, 6 Old Country Way, for a special event on October 2nd, 2021, from 12 p.m. until 10 p.m. Moved by Mr. Goodrich, second by? Second. Mr. Vignani, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries for nothing. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Good luck. Appreciate it. Thank Have you. A good good event. event. Joy. Next on our agenda are, um, there was an item on our agenda, Heritage Day's administrative fee appeal, but that has been canceled and um, the EDC is going to pay for the uh, administrative fee. Is that right, Lorraine? So on to board and committee meeting uh, applicants. We have two people for the historical commission. Can I stop for one second on that? Because sure. uh, yes. when I looked at that item, so I know that we charge a, f a fee. Every department co charges a 10% fee as well for their expenses. So yep. an administrative fee from the police, the fire. I think it was just those two, right? I think DPW does oh, also. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I didn't know we did it with police and fire. I knew we did it with DPW because we had to deal with with um, the sawhorses and stuff in the past. But that's been going on for, for since the beginning of that. Yeah, Nancy. There's, usually they would ask for a, a waiver of that. I think, don't they, generally? They normally ask for a waiver when they ask for the approval. Right. Hmm. What did Nancy say? What? Didn't hear you, Nancy. They, they normally ask for the waiver when they ask to come forward for the, the event approval. Right. We know that. We That's not. Remember. No, yeah. I, I get Tony's question. Yeah, I thought we had kind of taken care of that when we made that policy. I didn't realize that there were still these lingering other expenses, which add up to a heck of a lot more if you have to have a police detail there for a week. Um, you know, than a, than a fee for an event. So it's an administrative fees, for example, for the police above and beyond the cost of the detail? Yeah. So our policy only goes to the permit fee. Our policy, well, many of the streets left. I believe that the administrative fees would stay after that look at it. And then we made a decision on special event fees. Right. Which does not incorporate what we're talking about here. I don't think they did either when we were talking about it. I just didn't. All right, we may want to revisit that at some point in time, you know. For clarity. Yeah, they maybe put a cap on it or something. I mean, what, wasn't one of the bills like $2,400 or something? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, 
Thanks. Well, Sorry for the, no, $1,300. That's all right. So, um, back to the applications. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, I see, is here. Would you like to come up? Yes. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tell us why you're interested in the Historic Commission. Okay. I'm uh, Jack Whitaker. I am. Um, familiar faces, but um, by way of background, um, before I moved to Citruit, I was on the Natick Historic Commission at that experience, and also their Historic District Study Committee. We studied and we recommended two districts to town meeting, and they adopted them, all of downtown Natick's commercial district and then the commercial district in South Natick. Um, my undergraduate major was history. I was originally certified to be a high school history teacher. But I went in the Army, I went into banking, went into college administration. Um, I've had a lifetime interest in history, and particularly Plymouth County. Um, I took a couple elective courses as an undergraduate in historic architecture. That's fascinated me for years. It's put me in good stead because um, at one point in my career, I was director of budget and capital planning for the Mass Public Higher Ed System. They have the community colleges and the universities have a variety of historic buildings. Probably the most dramatic is Springfield Technical Community College. They occupy the site of the arsenal at Springfield. George Washington, God bless them, set up two arsenals, one at Springfield and one at Hoppus Ferry, and they manufactured all of the small arms for the military up to the right well, Springfield in 1965. And, um, Got it at that point. The federal government gave it to Massachusetts as the site of the community college in Springfield with the proviso that three buildings would be maintained <coughs> as museums and the rest of the buildings that date from the 1790s to like the 1930s would be maintained at least on the outside in their original form. Uh, this is another other examples. Roxby Community College has a lovely federal house very historic. It's used as a halfway house for people recovering from drugs. My most recent job I had before I retired was as Vice President for Administration and CFO at the State University in the Ox Maritime College. It's a sister college to Buzzards Bay. It's located in what was once Fort Schuyler, an 1850s fort, which ironically was designed by the Army's Chief Engineer, Robert E. Lee. Lee actually designed the defenses that he then tried to overcome as a Confederate general. The house that they gave us to live in was actually designed by Robert E. Lee. Um, when I was at the University of Hawaii, where I was Vice President for Administration, we were given a building by the University of Hawaii. Uh, there was a great effort to try and maintain the historical character of downtown Hilo, Hawaii. And we were able to get federal funds for the Bank of Hawaii building and a grant from Governor Cayetano to turn it into a small business incubator. A and, and we teamed up with the state's economic development people and our business faculty. And it became both a place where small businesses could come, get very affordable space, great mentoring, and, by the way, they would give us a 5% equity in the, building, in the business they were trying to develop which could be very lucrative if they were successful. Um, it was great, great, it worked. It worked. Small I don't want to go on a big lecture about small businesses, but people will start these endeavors without being properly funded and capitalized. They, they don't know how to market, and those kinds of things. It is, I've had an idea in my head that possibly the Old Gate School could be used for that purpose. Possibly. A lot of our businesses out there were computer-based you know, high on brains and thinking and low on space and materials. But anyway, all of this <clears throat> leads me, I saw in the paper there was a vacancy, and I'm generally familiar with the work of this Star Commission. It interests me. Um, sometimes these one-year moratoriums that can be imposed work. I'll just end with this little anecdote. My brother-in-law, uh, Frank Gross, was for many years the town moderator in Norfolk and also chairman of the school committee and a prominent lawyer. He and his wife retired and went to South North Carolina. They owned a building right in the middle of Norfolk Square, a mid-19th century 
building that had been a post office and a general store in Frank's law office. They had initially had a great offer from a firm that wanted to knock it down and make it into a strip mall. But the town, the Star Commission, imposed the one year demolition delay, which as it turned out, worked for them, doesn't always. Because a woman came along who wanted to use it as a bed and breakfast and as a place to run her scrap building, scrapbook building weekends. It was exactly what she wanted. She paid the price and the building got preserved. So sometimes this can work. And so that's me in a nutshell in, in my interest in this job. And well, you learn something every day. Yep. Robert E. Lee. You do. Maura? Um, yeah, Jack, have, we've had the same thought as you just brought forward with, you know, taking a look at Gates as an, an incubator and turning it to something like that, because I agree with you, it's, it's a lot, some great space in there. So if that's something that you on the Historic Commission would be eager to help kind of facilitate and, and find out how to navigate that, I think that would be of great assistance. And, you know, you've done a great job and been dedicated to the town on the Capital Planning Committee. Are you leaving that? I, I I'm still on the capital. Okay. No problem with the time commitment on both. There isn't any conflict. Of okay. Time. Okay. But thank you. Okay. That's all I have. Yeah. No. I, I think you actually answered some of the, the questions I had about obviously the background, having the you know knowing exactly what the commission is doing and what they're working on is. You know, I mean, it's, they're more like detectives sometimes, trying to figure out exactly some of the different areas. And yeah. So, well, one more quickie. Uh, when I was uh, in Natick, we ran a workshop called "What's Been Going On Here" for people who wanted to look at what had been going on at their home or their business. As you may know, there's now a wealth of original source material on the internet that can tell you just that that story. And uh, so, yeah. I know how to look up the history of the house. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Tony? Yeah, I just I just add, you know, your, your passion for the for the subject is great. Um, that's that's half of the battle, right? Wanting to do it. Um, say, yeah. yeah, you've been on Capitol for how long? Oh, gee, Probably five six, six seven years. years yeah. I think now, yeah. Right. So you know kind of how municipal government works. To some oh, extent, yes. yeah. Well, you know, I was on the school committee in Natick. I was on the advisory committee quite a while here in the 80s. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Great. So tell me how, so capital is quite different than, than the historical commission. Like, tell me how you, how you, what your role in those two would be. Because on capital, you kind of play one role, and then historical a little bit. What, like, well, capital budget, most of us, if not all of us on the capital budget, have very relevant experience. Uh, Joe is an assessor, you know, and, and people are builders and so forth. And our role is to advise the town using our analysis of a particular capital project is to advise the town. Uh, these are the pros and cons of it. Usually they're all cons once in a while. I know one of our members was spot on with the problem with uh, what was going to be developed in the town of favor and got a problem. You hold so on, Jeff. That, that's kind of what we do. You hold on for one second. Is there any way to turn the fan down just a little bit? Yeah. I can't. Can you guys hear? It's a little it's hard. The acoustics in here are tough these days. Would it help if you pull the microphone? Oh, sure. You, you're having trouble hearing me. How about the okay. That doesn't help us. Um, so that's kind of what we do uh, is pre-digest to look at these using a variety of expertise. And, uh, you know, some of our membership, uh, one of you sits on the committee, or one of the school committee, it was Peter Gates for a long time. So we, we have that input, too. We have very good relationship with you all and your town manager and with the school committee. Um, once in a while we do disagree, but that's kind of what we're there for. But we're strictly advisory. Now, the Historic Commission, if you look at their charge, it says you will identify, catalog, and then work to preserve the town's historical resources and their archaeological resources. Looking at the minutes of this meeting, of this committee, there is a lot of cases where someone wants to do either a, a demolition of a house that's, or a building that's over 100 years, or they want to make a major renovation. 
and as my understanding of what the committee's role is is to first of all look at whether that property does in fact have historical significance or archaeological significance and um, if it does it's particularly significant they do have the authority to impose a one-year demolition delay but what's supposed to happen during that is what I related happened to my brother-in-law and his wife there should be an effort to see if another worthwhile use can be made or a different buyer could be brought in and if I come onto the committee, one thing I'll try to do is hook us up more with nationwide realtors who are in the business of marketing historic pro uh, properties. They, they do exist. And uh, so that y you don't want to end up disadvantaging, uh, d disadvantaging someone who's got a house they want to sell. And it's actually possible you might help them. Yeah. Uh, but you should, if at all possible, not harm them and, and make this a worthwhile effort if you do decide you have to impose that, that uh, one-year delay. Okay. As Thanks. you know, yeah. I mean, we it's have only, some very significant properties in situ. Yeah, yeah, that's only one of many components of the yeah. committee, but, um, but certainly one that's very sensitive to the yeah, people, like tricky. you said. So yeah. it's that fine balance of yeah. doing the right thing for the piece of property, but also not harming um, the owner th yep. as well. So, well, thank you very much. Okay, That's all thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming in. Next up, we have James Galinsky, also for the Historic Commission. You are you are the author, aren't you? I am. An Mr. Author. Galinsky wrote a book about water and situate. Just published it within a couple of months ago, a few months ago. Uh, and uh, springtime. Very interesting. After uh, I read it, I said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> we're chasing the same problems they were chasing over 100 years yep. ago. At any rate, so would you tell us about yourself? <clears throat> okay, um, I'm an historian. <laughs> uh, I have several degrees in history, three master's degrees, uh, and I taught history at uh, Zavarian Brothers High School in Westwood for 41 years. First Catholic school I ever set my foot in and assumed I would just get a little experience and move on, but great place. Um, I also would like to give a shout out, uh, too bad he's not here still, uh, to Matt Elder uh, for, uh, I don't know how many people know that Untold Brewery uh, preserved a former fire station. I also wrote a book on the history of the Situate Fire Department. Uh, and schoolhouse, uh, which is their tap room. Uh, so uh, uh, I know at least one of the partners in there is a, a local situate uh, person, and they, they did that uh, very conscientiously, and they did a great job with that. So one example of uh, historic preservation, I guess. Um, since I retired, I've done a, a lot of volunteer work. Uh, <coughs> In the, in the town as a, a research assistant at the uh, archives with Betty Foster initially, and now my neighbor uh, Jody McDonough, uh, and also at the uh, Historic Society. Um, I used to go in a, a couple of days a week before it closed uh, for COVID, uh, and uh, they've started to reopen. Uh, currently working on a, uh, an article which may be part of a bigger project on uh, the temperance reform movement in situate before uh, the Civil War, uh, even though we have one of the highest per capita uh, ratings of consumption of alcohol now, uh, <laughs> situate used to be one of the leaders of uh, the temperance movement, actually, in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, so um, I actually got uh, an email from another local historian, uh, Lyle Nyberg, that many of you may know, and he said, for me, there was an opening on the historic commission. Thought I should be interested in that, and so uh, uh, I contacted Doug Smith and talked to him on the phone, and uh, actually attended uh, uh, as an observer one of their meetings uh, just to see what it, it uh, was like uh, to be uh, on the commission. Uh, so I filled out an application, and uh, here I am. Uh, <laughs> So I, I certainly don't have experience in the municipal government that the previous uh, interviewee uh, has, but uh, 
I am an historian. I'm very interested in uh, preserving uh, cities and towns' histories from when I lived in Dorchester and one of the historic neighbors who's there, Wellesley Park, uh, and Hingham for uh, 10 years where I lived in a 1699 house, a Joan Beale house, uh, and was on the uh, Hingham Historical Society as a, a member of the, the board, actually. Uh, and uh, had my house on a house tour in Hingham uh, a few times. And uh, I know that's something that uh, the commission is starting to think about perhaps doing here, uh, is uh, getting house tour together and just to let people know that we do have some historic properties uh, in, in the town. Uh, one thing I've discovered uh, through working in the, in the archives in the historic society is that there are aren't a lot of people in town who really understand the, the great historical tradition that this, this town's had. Uh, and when I was living in Hingham, I didn't really think of Situate as being as an historic, an historic town as, as it turns out that it, that it is. Um, it, Hingham, quite honestly, has done a great job of preserving many, many uh, old properties in, in town. Uh, Situate doesn't have as many uh, as, as Hingham, and there are lots of reasons for that, but I would certainly like to, to see the ones that we uh, have recognized to uh, preserve. Uh, also, uh, just a personal experience for me, uh, I'm a walker, I walk all over town. Uh, and uh, I just remember soon after I moved in, I was walking down Ann Vinyl, which has several old houses up at the upper end near uh, Manhill Road and, and Tilden. Uh, and it was this great 18th century colonial house uh, about halfway up uh, and vinyl. Uh, and I went away on a uh, vacation or for a conference or something. And I came back and I hadn't walked up and vinyl for two weeks. And the house was gone. <laughs> and I said, how could they possibly have torn that thing down? And then soon enough, two other new houses were put on the property. Uh, and uh, it kind of it really bothered me uh, that, that that meant allowed to happen. Uh, so restoring and uh, making sure that we preserve the houses that we do have in town uh, is something that's uh, really very important to me. Uh, and that's certainly a big part of the job of the historic commission is really to identify the historic uh, properties that we have. And they've, they've made a lot of progress on that, uh, sorry, with the help of Lyle Nyberg, actually. Uh, who's cataloged a lot of those, those houses. So part of the commission's work, a real important part, is just identifying the historic resources that we have in, in town and trying to preserve them. Um, so that's essentially why I'm interested in uh, being on the commission. Thank you. Andrew, any questions? I, have you, um, I, I love your background as an educator, because one of the things I've talked a little bit about is kind of integrating uh, our history is our story and you need great storytellers um, and I know there's there's some attempts to, to kind of bring in the historical commission to some of the younger grades in our schools but for the high school level or other or other levels a lot of other towns do it they did it I grew up in Easton they used to do that your last class you would take before you graduate was learn the history of the towns and when you leave you remember to fall in love with it um, and there's something interesting about that because we're talking about um, educating folks and talking because people don't remember you have to tell the story so do you have any thoughts on um, the good the bad the ugly and some sort of an of approach like that or um, well as a farmer uh social studies chairperson of the history department and uh, as uh, the president of the Severians Academic Council. Uh, unfortunately, there's only so many minutes in a day. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it would be great if every high school or even uh, middle school or even lower schools could, could have a course in, in local history. Uh, but practically, <laughs> it would be really tough uh, to do. Uh, but I would love to see the uh, U.S. history teachers uh, in uh, Situate use a couple of my books to uh, <laughs> have uh, students get familiar with local history. They're very readable and they're short. Uh, 
and I'd be certainly glad to come in and uh, give, give some, some talks, which I, which I actually do uh, uh, for both uh, the Historic Society and uh, actually for the North and South River Watershed Association, which, Association, which I also wrote a history of recently. Um, so it would be great to have local history in the, the curriculum, uh, but I don't want to say that it's something that might happen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just briefly, you know, I agree with Andrew, your background is spot on. Um, as I mentioned before, I think the passion is what really makes people really successful in these types of committees. Someone that y you want to go to the meetings and you want to be involved and you do stuff outside of the meetings. And it, it seems like you have all that. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, you'd be a great candidate for the position as well. You can expand the committee to, to six people. <laughs> Well, the one thing that we always say is that many times we get more than one good applicant, and we, we definitely involve people, I mean, uh, you know, advise people to get involved, even if you're not on the committee. You, all the meetings are open meetings. They'll listen to you, <laughs> your ideas, whether, you're, whether you get a vote or you don't get a vote. But um, um, in this case, are there two positions? Is there an, so associate, an associate, associate position as well? Two, one associate and one full. Yes. Yeah. Like, is that right? Yeah, So adding an associate. He has an associate now, uh, and he would like another associate. Because he's been on the meeting for the next couple of years, and he would like to Yeah, it's nice to have that bench. So Just adding a, an associate, so there's two. Okay. It's not a bylaw, so it doesn't need a bylaw change. Right. All right. Well, Mr. Polinski, thank okay. you for coming thank you. in. Appreciate your passion for the history of the town. I actually had heard at one point that Situate owns more historic buildings than any other town in the Commonwealth, including the city of Boston, because a lot of historical properties are either privately owned or owned by foundations, associations, friends of, etc. So um, that was a little factoid that stuck in my head at one point. The town actually owns historic properties, which a lot of towns don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, thank you. Um, next, Aaron Hurd, Beautification Commission. No, Ms. Hurd. Okay. David Deneen, Waterways Commission. Mr. Deneen, welcome. Good evening. Welcome. How is everybody? Very good. Would you like to tell us about yourself and why you're interested in the Waterways Commission? Sure. My name's David Deneen. I live on Tilden Road. I've been in Situate for over 20 years. Uh, my wife, Paula, uh, born and raised here. There's may, there may be a guy in the second row that might be related to me, but um, I don't know if... Uh, Mike. <laughs> um, I have a daughter, Elizabeth. Uh, she works around town down the village market and over at Rote, and I have a son who's starting the eighth grade tomorrow. So. Uh, uh, some, a little more personally, um, I've uh, been very, uh, I've been an advocate uh, of rescuing endangered sea turtles uh, along Cape Cod Bay for the last six, seven years. Uh, professionally, uh, I'm a former 30-year licensed airport manager in the state of Massachusetts. Hi, Andrew. Nice to see you again. Yep. Uh, we do a lot of different types of uh, work advocating uh, for aviation. Uh, educating people about aviation. Uh, I continue to uh, foster that relationship uh, both on the state, local, and uh, regional levels. Uh, today, uh, with the waterways, uh, I have been sailing most of my life. Uh, recently, I've been sailing on Big Fish with Greg Morse now for probably about six years on and off. Uh, I have uh, sailed exclusively uh, up and down the East Coast and uh, competed some high levels. Currently, I've got a 17-foot uh, whaler that I like to bomb around and, uh, and uh, explore and have some fun with and I'm teaching uh, David how to, to run it now. Um, it, uh, the ocean's very, been always very, very important to me. I like what happens to it. I think what I can bring to uh, the Waterways Commission is my, uh, my expertise uh, and my knowledge of working with uh, local, state, and federal governments, uh, understanding how they work and how to try to promote 
how to try to bring in grants, uh, understanding where some of the, the grants are. Um, I've worked uh, very uh, exclusively with a lot of our state reps and state senators as well as our congressmen. So um, understanding how they work and what we need to do when we're trying to uh, solicit additional uh, uh, money or uh, grants for projects is very important. Uh, I've been spending quite a bit of time uh, watching the current board and seeing how they operate and I find that they are a very well run organization. I'm not just saying that to Mike but uh, you can really see that the members uh, bring a lot of value and they bring a lot of different ideas and opinions to the board. And I think that's something that I could do. I think with my, my knowledge uh, uh, and my skills, my skill set would give me the opportunity to really help uh, help that group continue to, to grow and learn and, uh, and foster good uh, 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 pieces for uh, our community, as well as making sure that we're open uh, on how we uh, work on uh, different issues. And I thought it was very, very clear uh, at the, the last uh, meeting last week that uh, it's very important about being transparent and being open about how they run the board. And to me, that's very, very important. And that's something that I would also bring to the table. I think that's me in a nutshell. Um, I really enjoy our town. I want to be able to give back. Uh, the only other thing I can say is I was on the Public Building Commission here back in the uh, 2003 to about 2011. Uh, 2011, I was the chairman of the board. Uh, my job changed a little bit, so I had to step away. But uh, to me, it's always about uh, trying to help your community, and that's what I'd like to be able to offer. Thank you. Thank you. More. Sure. Great background. So thank you for stepping forward. And um, I, I agree with you. It sounds like your experience working with federal, state, and local officials will be critical as we continue to get grants to improve the harbor. So spending a lot of time on the harbor as you do, what is something that you see um, from you know your perspective that you'd like to accomplish when you're on the committee? Uh, the biggest challenge that I see is that, um, unfortunately, uh, the harbor's getting shallow again. Uh, it's a very large uh, commercial port uh, between uh, Situate and Marshfield. It's one of the largest uh, commercial ports uh, in the state. Uh, it brings a lot of uh, in, um, economical uh, input and uh, it brings a lot of money in. Uh, it provides a lot of jobs. So it's important that we keep our waterways open. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I know that uh, right now Situate and Marshfield are trying to figure out how they're going to move forward um, with, some, with some planning and uh, I just think that uh, we need to make sure that the harbor is accessible. The other thing that uh, I've already sent letters to all of our um, elected officials uh, uh, on the state level and federal about uh, losing the uh, seasonal uh, Coast Guard station. It's a very, very important uh, aspect of what we do in keeping people safe and when you've got you know over 2,200 uh, boats both pleasure and commercial that operate between say, uh, uh, Cohasset, Mans uh, Marshfield, and Situate, that, that's a lot of people, and we need to have that coverage. Without that, uh, I mean, that's, that's critical time. And not saying that our harbor master and our police departments uh, don't do a great job, but they can only go so far. And having that expertise, especially if you're out a little bit farther in Cape Cod Bay, it's, uh, it's crucial that we try to keep them here uh, in Situate. So I encourage everybody to write, uh, to send emails to our, uh, our state and our federal leaders and let them know how important this is to us. Thank you for that shout out. We, we couldn't agree with you more on that. And um, I think you'd be a great candidate. So thank you for coming forward. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, no, I mean, again, I think, again, your background um, is wonderful. And uh, we've talked and seen the demonstration what you've done at the airport and helping um, provide some safety for our, our beachgoers and having some extra eyes up in the air uh, is always important. Yeah, we didn't um, talk about our shark program. That's right. The, yeah. um, and it's just, but, but seeing you able to kind of interact and, and work with other folks, it's, it's really it's nice to say so. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. You did a good job explaining your, your interest in it. Your background is, is relevant and you enjoy you know, you enjoy the things that that committee is in charge of. So I think I think you kind of check all the boxes there. Thank you. Um, I do have a question for Lorraine, though. I just want to understand the openings. Um, it looks like there's one full-time opening, but there's one associate that may want to go up to that role. Yes, they, uh, members of the board, uh, 
and So there's one opening and on both the committee and the associate. To piggyback on Tony, is there anything in our bylaws that prohibits us from adding associates um, just as liaison and attending the meetings and speaking with Mike? You know, there are some folks that are going to start I'll thinking about the leaving. I'll take them the okay, because if we could have more than just what we have, one associate, two uh, associate we positions. We have two. We have two, yeah. right? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So is it Mr. Haley who's currently an associate who wants to move us? Mr. Haley, correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Hopefully we'll be voting tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should I wait for Lorraine? No. No. Mark Devereaux. Is Mark Devereaux here? Mark Devereaux. I think that's the name, isn't it? Uh, oh, T.J. T. T. Malvesti. Malvesti. Oh, all right. Is I'm sorry. Name? Yeah, I see it now. Yeah. I just jumped down. You must be T.J. I'm T.J. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Would you like to tell us about yourself and why you're interested in the Waterways Commission? Absolutely, I'd love to. I just um, retired after 30 years of uh, Coast Guard service. I retired out as the commander of uh, Coast Guard Station Point Allerton and also the seasonal unit here that's under discussion here in Situate. Uh, I've been on the water all my life. Grew up in Gloucester, lobstered commercially, recreationally, and have always had a passion for the ocean, obviously, through my Coast Guard service. Uh, well versed in, in all marine affairs from pollution to response to aids to navigation to fortification to adaption to different strategies on how to um, harden and, and make uh, you know waterways viable uh, both from an you know economic standpoint as well as from a you know a, a citizen wanting to go for sale standpoint so a um, lot of experience a lot of background and certainly um, you know, after 30 years of service, it's almost in me where I want to continue the public service and giving back. <coughs> we moved to Situate three years ago, and this is where we're going to stay. We chose this as a retirement place, so um, certainly would like to get involved. And um, I'm a recreational boater, just like a lot of us. Both of my children are on the water through uh, Situate Rex Sailing. So not only uh, have I been on it professionally in the course of my duties, but also as a, as a user of the harbor as well. So excited to get involved any way I possibly can. Right. Well, thank you for your service in the Coast Guard. It's dangerous. It's, it's, it is dangerous. It's fun. It's exciting. And it's very exciting, but I think the, uh, the service has set us up for success as far as keeping us safe and having measures, uh, risk assessment measures, and all the gear that we have to keep the gal gals and guys out there safe when they're on the water. So. Well, thank you. Laura, any I do. I'm going to ask you the same question. Sure. You know, as a user of our waterways, what do you see as being one of the more pressing issues that the Waterways Commission should address I, in the upcoming years? I think it's going to be the, the sustained growth over the next couple of years. Uh, back in May, the uh, National Marine Manufacturers Association put out a, a report projecting the, the growth of people wanting to be boaters, wanting to buy new boats, the used market. And it looks for the next two to three years, the post-pandemic surge of boating is going to continue. So I think that the town needs to continue to adapt to that surge and also be prepared for when that wave is, when we're on the other side of that wave, how we can sustain the harbor in the most economical uh, manner possible. So I think that is probably, probably going to be our biggest um, challenge in the coming years. And that, of course, you know, with Station Situate potentially closing, um, the harbor master, the chief of police with the marine unit, and of course, the fire chief with the dive team, uh, very, very capable. But I, I think if we do lose situate, there has to be some planning involved, uh, station situate, um, in response measures going forward to serve the, the town. You'd certainly be a good advisor for that, so thank you. Probably not. Yeah. 
Andrew? I just, I'm just, I'm so impressed at <laughs> all these different folks who are so accomplished and willing lucky. to step forward. We are very, yeah, we're very lucky. You know, I think we're going to be a great candidate. And again, that, that vision to look forward uh, you know, years down the road, uh, no questions. I, mean, and I think that's the biggest thing I've seen in I was on Nantucket for a while. They were adapting to some of the changes with the tourism. I was out there during 08 when we started to see some of the tourism start to go away because of the economic crisis. So the town was, you know, faced with, okay, we, we depend on this amount of, you know, transient moorings. How's that going to affect? So I think a strategic plan for when things do taper off a little bit is, is certainly in our best interest. That's a good point. Tony. Yeah, just... Um, now I'll piggyback on Tamora. You, you mentioned adapting to you know an increased volume of boaters. Mm -hmm. Give me like one idea. What's something we're gonna have to deal with? I think a couple of things. We've we've done a, a huge improvements to Cole Parkway, and I know that there's a plan with after the pilings. We're looking at some some new floating docks as well. I think we're going to see an increase of people. You, know, you can hear them on the radio calling. Hey, I need a pump out. We could maybe look at a different pump out station someplace else to, to try to in the harbor maybe at the I know one thing was being talked about maybe at the, the boat ramp Jericho boat ramp um, I think that's going to be um, something to look at too is how are people going to you know the transit the amount of transits we have how are they going to you know get to shore get rid of their waste and what services on shore can we provide as a town to make sure that they feel welcome and they want to come back you know and, and, and spend money to reserve a mooring whether it be through any of the mooring services in the harbor Great. Thanks again. As Andrew said, just great qualified people. So we can't make a bad we can't make a bad choice. No. Excellent. It's true. All right. Thank you for coming. Well, in. I appreciate your time. Thank you so Sorry, much. Thank you. Thank you. Over there. I know I've got Brian Cronin. So in order, I did my answer to your question. Okay. Um, so we only have nine members. One of whom should be the hiring manager. It has no limit on assessments. Great. That's awesome. It's good to know. Right. Correct. Right. Perfect. Thanks, Lori. Yep. Karen, before we go on, yes. um, TJ, you also wrote on your application that you're interested in coastal advisory. Okay, great, thank you. And we do have openings on coastal advisory, I believe. I'm waiting to find out about two positions there. There's one opening. Okay. And we have uh, we have an interview. Charlene. Okay. But as I said, I'm waiting to hear on two kinds of All right. Thank you. 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 All right. Good evening. Would you like Hi. to tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, so this is my uh, second uh, round. I was on Waterways back in uh, 2015 to 2017. I was chairman for one year. Uh, I think uh, I've been going to Waterways meetings since uh, 2011. I was sitting here looking at the year or so. Um, so my background, I was uh, in college. I was an assistant harbor master uh, in situate. I was... Um, after that, I worked in the marine trade for about 10 years. Um, I'm a licensed captain. So I'm a boat owner and, uh, like I said, been, uh, had, have had a lot of interest uh, in waterways since, uh, since I, I worked down the harbor. So currently I have a, a mooring in the South River and spent a lot of time down there, especially uh, during the pandemic working from, working from the boat. Um, and uh, so that's sort of my background. So you were on waterways before, and why did you leave? Uh, I, I didn't get reappointed, so oh, okay. it was just right. gave it. It happens. Yeah. Andrew. I guess kind of your your question. If, Good. If I steal Take it. it. <laughs> steal what it. would you like to <laughs> see oh. change or a comp? Um, I think uh, I think um, the kind of hit on before is dredging dredging the harbor finishing up the South River, um, and then uh, accessibility, and, uh, and also, you know, how to do, making sure that the waterways are patrolled uh, with the uh, added, all the added boaters out there. So, uh, 
I think focused on education and safety of the uh, the additional boaters is just uh, seem to be a lot of uh, new boaters and um, just make sure that uh, that everybody's doing it safe. So I think the the marine unit and the harbor master do a great job now or they just need to uh, i mean just continue doing it so. right Tell me. yeah um you are you still in the maritime business some no no oh. Not anymore. oh you're not and what did you do in it i don't did you say uh i sold boats i sold boat parts boat paint okay um yeah i guess that was it okay. involved in it worked it worked, boat, in a boat, yeah. I worked in a boat yard too, okay. for a while so Great. Yeah. Um, again, you've got experience having been on the committee and, and background and passion to do it. So another another strong candidate. Um, you know, I think all of you would serve well. Yeah. And Brian's um, he, he attends several of the meetings. He's never really stopped paying attention, even when um, he wasn't reappointed in 2017. So his passion has always remained high. And he's I think he's continued to provide some good input to the committee over the years, so. Thanks. I'd welcome them back. <laughs> okay. Right. Here's an endorsement for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, Thank you for while in. we have all three of them here, so there's only one opening, are you, all of you interested in an associate position if that became available? Yes. yes sir. Okay, good. All right. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, Charlene Richard. Can I say one more thing, only so we can make this easier? TJ, would you be more interested in an associate position or being involved in the in the uh, Coastal Advisory? I think if uh, associate would be great if there would be potential in the years to come and possibly move up to. Okay. So. Great. I, I just want to make sure as we yeah. make our decisions, we've got the. And we put you in the place. The full landscape. Yeah, where you want to be. Thank so. you. Charlene Richard. Hello. Have you heard the questions? <laughs> Would you like I, to tell us about yourself and sure. why you're interested in the Coastal Advisory Commission? Um, I'm pretty much, well, almost a lifelong resident of Situate. Uh, my family moved here in 69. My father, parents were a business owner in town. Uh, my brother is currently a business owner in town. I took the uh, route of going to school and teaching at Situate High one year, and that was the year that Prop 2 and a half came through. So I obviously couldn't keep that job, and I went into Boston and worked in the financial industry. Uh, over 30 years there, I always gladly commuted back to Situate. I real, feel strongly about the town, and I'm sure I'll be here forever. Um, I am a former sailing enthusiast. A lot of racing out of the harbor, PHRF, even the frostbiting in the winter. And more recently, my husband and I had a 36-foot uh, Grand Banks that we've enjoyed as sort of a cottage, you know, traveled around from Long Island to all over the coast. Um, I had re retired and looking to get more involved, and when I heard that you were looking for people to help, basically, that's why I'm here. Um, I was also recently asked to join the Historical Commission Endowment Society, which would be perfect with my background in finance. I was a fixed income bond trader for 30 years, so I'm looking forward to helping them. Um, that's about it, and I agree with many of the comments these people have made about what needs, you know, what the concerns are, even if they're on a different committee. I, I, the environment is particularly of worry. I live where I can see the harbor. <coughs> from the house. I live at the beginning of Beaver Dam Road, so I have watched the storms and I have watched the flooding and I, you know, I, I'm right there. Um, so I know Maura knows a lot about Coastal Advisory, maybe you want to? Sure. Um, thank you, Charlene, for coming forward. So we have one opening, right, Lorraine? <clears throat> no, it's not clear, right? Um, we have two people that are currently on the board to get back to the Okay. But Louise um, stepped down, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so at least Four one. Occupants. Okay, great. Okay. okay, all right. So that sounds good. So coastal advisory really is about coastal resilience, right? And I think um, the biggest challenge has been COVID. I think set us back considerably, not being able to meet and not keeping um, our one hundred million dollar identified you know, improvement plan moving forward. So we've sort of got to step on that. So Q 
curious, just knowing that little bit of <clears throat> 30,000 foot overview, you know, what type of skill set do you think you could bring to the committee to help coalesce and get everybody going again? Well, you, there's a problem, you mean there's a problem still meeting, to getting people together? I, I, I am not aware of the last time they, they got together I yet. See. So that's, we just well, got a new, we just um, hired a new coastal resource officer. Mm -hmm. So I believe she's also getting her, okay. her footings as well, for lack well, of a Well, I think work. my experience is not really with committees, but in management and business, I was definitely a liaison because as a bond trader, I had to deal with the sell side and uh, buy side, you know, managers. I worked for, there was no commission involved here. It was a, it was a um, endowments and, uh, and, and mutual funds and things like that. And I was just able, to, long time career bond trader, I was able to make it work. So high pace, collaborator. Yes. Coordinate, you know, multitask. All Excellent that. attributes that we need. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. A committee like this. Do you have any thoughts about coastal resiliency? Were you clear that that's what the Coastal Advisory Commission really looked at? Well, I try. I, I, I didn't get the proper invite like to this. That so I wasn't sure what was going to be expected of me, and I started to just read through the documents today, and uh, I haven't gotten through everything. There are a lot. Don't worry. But it's about the that. environmental from a personal. F heartfelt point, it's the environmental that f is the most threatening aspect, I think. And the safety for these new boat owners as well. You know, I, I saw someone run aground in the harbor just this weekend and I thought, that channel's pretty well marked. What are you doing over there, you know? Yeah. Um, Exploring. <laughs> yeah, not paying attention. <laughs> not paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just, it's just, uh, want to help and I'm not sure exactly how. <coughs> Excellent. So, it's all great. Lorraine, is this, is this the committee that has the inland rep and the out? Yes. The yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, do you live inland, or it sounds like you live oh, no, on a I, boat? <laughs> I see the harbor from every room in my house. Yeah, I live at Ten Beaver Dam. It's like. All right. So you're a coastal yeah. resident. Okay. Right. Just want to clarify that. It's the house with the new fence. Everybody talking about the new fence. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that does look good. <laughs> the one that was repaired after the car went through the old fence, right? That's right. Yeah. There yeah. you go. <laughs> That warrants a new fence, Andrew. <laughs> no, I, I mean to re to re-energize, uh, you know, a committee. It's it's difficult, but it's needed, and it's um, um, I mean, resilience, resiliency, and just trying to get people. You know, the focus is not always the um, yeah. the easiest topic because they're they're kind of esoteric understandings of, of you know, it's not just walls and putting seagrass and there, there's a lot of kind of moving parts. So kind of having that understanding. And if you have that willingness to kind of go through all the different mm -hmm. aspects, because there are, it's, it's like, a, it's, yeah, like be 10 happy million be, different things you can do, and yeah. what's the best, you know? I'd be happy to be the, the fresh blood. Yeah, okay, great. Sounds good, Tommy? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd add is this committee is a little bit different than others because um, sometimes you work very hard for something and it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at plans that are 25, 50 years in the future, and we'll put a little, a lot of energy into it, and then the neighbors won't want it, or there'll be roadblocks that don't get you there. Whereas if you're on beautification, you go plant a tree and it's there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work that goes into it, and not always the, not always the, maybe feeling of success, um, but it is something that's definitely needed. And there's a lot of details to it, and there's a lot of. I guess more of an educational component mm -hmm. where you have to really explain to people that don't understand what could happen, what's going on, and, mm -hmm. and almost kind of teach them about what, what the likelihood or the possibility of stuff to occur is. I think that's a good role for me. My degree is in education, mm -hmm. business education. My, my experience in my career, we certainly didn't get everything right. No one does. But, you know, and it is a constant combination of things that you bring together to, to come to a conclusion about what the right investment is or what, who the right people are to get involved in that group. And I think I've had good success yeah, with that. And I'm not judging whether it's a strength of yours or not. I'm just, that's just my impression on the committee. Because we've mm -hmm. all been um, to many, many meetings and talked to many consultants and put a lot of presentations together. Right. And... Um, you know, and it's, it's, 
it's a report for something somewhere that, that we hope we act on. And most of the things that you want to do cost way more money than the town can afford. So it's it's really picking those picking those projects that can make an impact probably that are actually doable. So um, anyways, I think it's a great committee. There's a ton to learn. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more aspects just at the boating aspect. You know, there's the residential aspect, for the sure. commercial aspect. Um, and it's got to be addressed. I mean, Rick Murray brought this up when I first started the board many years ago and, um, you know, kind of got us on that channel of, hey, we got to start paying attention to this before before you know it, it'll be here. So, anyways, thanks for applying. Good. Well, especially after what we witnessed this past week down in New York, um, I think it's time to put this back on right. the front our burner. radar, the front burner, yeah. Well, thank you for thank coming you. in. Thank we appreciate it. Thank you, Charlene. So, I know Connor Doherty is not coming in. He could be here tonight. He has no plan to get the next board meeting on September 21st. Okay. So, Mark Devereaux? I don't see anyone else in here. Okay. All right. So, we're done with that. Um, we will be voting at least some of these at the end of the evening. No need to stay if you're waiting for us to vote it could be another hour or so from here but if we vote anything Lorraine will call and let you know I would like to read I got a new uh, call one of my son's brothers just died oh, oh sorry sorry, yeah. sorry Jack oh yeah yeah, oh, yeah. no yeah. need to stay yeah. here that's for sure yeah. thank you it looks like you have two positions I mean yeah we're good we're good <laughs> thank you thank you all very thank much thank you very much good luck Jack <coughs> Discuss vote one year extension of school bus lease. Dr. Robert Dutch. Dr. Dutch, you look, you look like different Dr. this Dutch. evening. <laughs> Ms. Holt. Are you hitting for Dr. Dutch this evening. All right. Where's my thing? So good? the um, three year lease for the school buses has expired. Um, and the most expeditious way to deal with this is just to have it extended by one year, and that's what um, Dr. Dutch and Superintendent Burkhead did. They approached the current uh, leaseholder and asked if they could just extend the lease for a year. The leaseholder agreed. Um, it's for the same price for one more year, and then in the, in the meantime, they will be uh, going out to bid for a five-year lease on these uh, buses. It's the same buses we currently have. Uh, nothing else is changing. So that's what they were, um, we sent all the documents out to town council, asked town council if the select board needed to take a vote on the extension because they voted on the original lease and town council recommended that the board vote on the extension as well. Do they have drivers for all these buses? That I cannot answer. That was gonna be one of my questions too, is um, what does the student, um, how many students have signed up for the buses this year? You know, is it up, is it down? It, you know, are they seeing kids come back? Um, I, I don't know about kids coming back, either, right? the, 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 the fees are coming in, so. Yeah, um, okay. I think tomorrow will be a telltale sign, depending on mm. the traffic that comes through. So they don't I, actually know how many people have signed up to take the buses? I don't point? know. I'm sure they, they know, because they would have already had to set their routes. And if they could have released some of the buses, they, he would have done that when he negotiated it. Right. That's what I was going to say. If they, if they didn't need them, they wouldn't have right. asked for a one-up on them. Um, Nancy, is the the cost is the same, and the impact on the um, shared expenses will be the same? Yes, the uh, cost for this particular lease is one hundred and sixty-seven thousand. So it's not the it's just one of uh, at least two or three leases that they have. This one's only fourteen buses. We have about nineteen buses. Any questions from anyone? No, it's probably not, not that a, can be answered. Yeah. <laughs> well, I they wouldn't. No offense, Nancy. <laughs> it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I mean, the buses are also very active, not just picking up and dropping, like after but school after school. Yeah, yeah. Going no, absolutely. Sports and, yeah. Yeah. The return to field trips, hopefully. No, but I mean, seriously, that there's a huge shortage of bus drivers, and if yeah. you don't have enough yeah. bus drivers, you might as well not have the buses. But Well, and I was just curious, you know, what we, budge what we budgeted in the school budget for busing, was it the same? Did we anticipate re-signing, renegotiating? Do you know that? Um, I know that they 
they've settled all of their contracts except for the teachers. Mm -hmm. So um, those have all been settled. So there isn't anything that I'm aware of that is different in their contractual bargaining. Um, I think like everyone that has school bus driver school buses they've been looking for drivers as well yeah i've not heard anything anecdotally about you know there being a severe shortage i did hear anecdotally that there were you know 47 positions that were filled so as people have been retiring and there's been movement i don't know where they all fall and i don't know how many more additional openings are still that they're trying to fill okay the only thing i'd add is probably not the best time to buy a vehicle right now um, Don't so exist. I think that's just also the prices yep. of yeah, everything yeah. is so high. Point. It's probably a good time just to extend the lease and yeah, and the availability. Yeah. yeah. All right. Would you like a motion? Yes, please. Moves that the select board extend for one year the 2018 lease with Wells Fargo Equipment Finance Incorporated for 14 2019 school buses. Second. Second by Mr. Vignani. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. Thank Ms. you, Holt. <laughs> Next, to discuss vote declaration of surplus miscellaneous harbor master items. Mr. Petro. This is really just a What's lot of stuff list? that's there's all kinds there. of stuff. <laughs> stuff that's been piling up in the harbor master's office, uh, stuff that's been left, stuff that's theirs. Uh, I know the fire pump has already been given to the DPW. They'll use that to pump out catch basins and stuff. Okay. I think they're taking one of the generators, but uh, this is stuff that's been basically taking up space in the Harbor Masters building forever. Uh, we'll put them up on our auction website and get the best price we can and just get rid of them. Sounds good to me. Sounds like an efficient garage sale. Um, Andrew, any questions? No, I'm, I'm just going through the Looking the for list. something? No, yeah. Board, perhaps? Uh, Maura, you can replace your shackles. <laughs> what? They've got some on the auction block here. Well, let me see what you need re <laughs> replacing here. <laughs> the chain, perhaps. Anyway, yes, Tony, do you have any? Mr. Vignani, would you like to make a motion? That's my only comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, I would. Move to approve the disposal of obsolete Harbor Master items in a surplus auction. Moved by Mr. Vignani, second. Second. Second by Ms. Current. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 4 0. And Thank you. where will people be able to see this stuff, Jim? We when? have an online auction site that we use. Yeah, when, like, if someone's interested in outbidding Mora on those. Yeah, jewelry. it'll take us a while to get pictures of everything, so but it'll take a couple weeks at least. Will yeah. Stephen blast it out on his constant contact we'll, we'll list? We'll blast it out, yep. Okay. And he'll put it out too. It'll be on the website, I assume. So. Next, Up, discuss vote accessory dwelling fees. Mr. Kaffer. Uh, Kevin should be coming in. Let me go, please. Are we ahead of time? Is that why? A little bit, yeah. You're moving along. He usually watches, but he'll be coming in. Um, probably not the best title. It's not really for accessory dwellings. Right. Accessory dwellings, we already require a connection fee. What happens is, uh, people will do something less than an accessory dwelling. They'll put a bathroom, a toilet, and a sink in a garage building. That's not an accessory dwelling. Then they hook up to the saw. There's no fee for that. And then later they'll come back and they'll upgrade it, and we never get the fee. So it's confusing for the saw department what's an accessory dwelling, what's not an accessory dwelling. So basically what they're looking to do is if you're putting in something that needs a saw connection, you pay the connection fee, period and eliminate the confusion with the planning board and the, the zoning article as to what is an accessory dwelling. But the idea is if you're building something that has a water or sewer connection, there's a fee, period. Right. I'll say Kevin did it. This is Ms. Burbine, the chair of the uh, planning committee. I think it will clarify things if you say accessory use. Take that under advisement. Thank you, Tony. No, to say? Okay. I do, but oh, you do I say. shouldn't say. Oh, okay. It's a bad joke. <laughs> Not about you, man. Yeah. Maura, 
No, I'm waiting for these guys. Yeah. I, okay, I didn't bring well in. Well, I didn't, didn't steal I, I thought well, I didn't know if there's anything more. It, but I didn't. Well, I didn't know if Kevin had anything else he wanted to add. I well, didn't since catch. he wasn't here. The ex <laughs> accessory <laughs> drilling Sorry, hookups. Sorry. Yep, I apologize about that. So um, I think Jim get into a little bit how we always have an issue between building, uh, planning, water, sewer, and, and everything else about what classifies it. There's a little bit of a loophole. Some people build accessory dwellings, but they don't put the kitchen in, so then there's no way to track it with the water and sewer and how it goes. So um, they don't get charged the fees, and then we have no way to track the necessary lines and connect up to the property. So we don't know it's a potential source of inflow and infiltration, as well as source of water leaking, because we don't get to check the materials that they typically use connecting the water lines up. So it came to our attention. Um, Will's been working on it. He met with the planning um, director, um, building department, um, and town council. Town council, as well as uh, you and Kyle, and they're also correct. Uh, not for this meeting. Okay, no. Kyle didn't meet that meeting, and they met with town council and asked what we had to do. Is it a complete bylaw change? Is it something that the selectmen could um, define what an accessory dwelling is? And and that's why we're before you tonight. Town council had said that. Um, could be just the definition of an accessory dwelling, any freestanding building. Well, this is clear as mud. Um, it is. Does anyone? Want so, to so if anybody money? wants a sewer hookup, then you're going to charge them the sixteen thousand dollars, regardless so, of what you're so doing with this it. This is they've already got a sewer hookup. Okay. So it's they additional. want to put a house, or some people have been putting. Um, summer homes or, or little accessory dwellings and they might have in-laws in there, they might rent them out. We see some go out to Airbnbs or, or other issues that people are, are using them for. Um, or just in-law apartments, you know, we're not sure what So there's doing. a sewer going in and they're running a line off at somewhere else. So then they've already paid their sewer connection. Typically what happens if you're gonna build one of those accessory dwellings, which is allowed, um, you would need to get a, um, you'd have to pay a half fee for the accessory dwelling. What is happening is, if that's not classified as an accessory dwelling because they're not putting in, say, a stove, they wouldn't have to pay the fee. So they build the entire structure, some people have, and then we don't even know about it being a water and sewer department. And then after everybody's gone, then they have the stove or a kitchen or, or whichever to that section, and, and it just kind of skirts the rule. So we're looking to just try to clarify it. It is muddy. And that's one of the things we all discussed, and they discussed trying to clarify it and find out what those, um, what they can do on that. So, Will, um, did I miss anything or? Nope, that about covers it. Uh, we, we have an existing fee structure for accessory dwellings. Uh, we want to be able to promote or allow those dwellings to exist in town, uh, but we were seeking a way to better define these terms. Uh, town Council essentially recommended that we can clarify these terms through an action through the select board. Um, so we're here to help clarify those terms that way, you know, if anyone connects additional utilities to an additional structure on site, uh, that there's a, you know, a, re a related fee to cover the capacity use of the utility system uh, that's being used. So if you're connecting to sewer, you're using a little bit of sewer capacity. Um, this fee, you know, covers the upkeep and maintenance for maintaining and providing that capacity. And the fees, the fee is the fee, but one of the main concerns that we have too is especially with sewer, we want to be involved with the piping, the pipe material, and the quality of workmanship so that we don't have additional I and I problems in the future. Because if people don't use the correct pipe or correct incorrectly, we've got no way to know what's going on there. And hence we might miss something to that effect. Andrew? So <clears throat> so is the issue it's it's because these structures are detached, and so the fear is, is that so, okay, if somebody added three bathrooms to their house, they're not paying that fee. Right. So because it's, and they're, okay. Because it's detached, yes. And so you've got to run that line, and you want to make sure you can see that line under. Got it. Okay, I'm just trying to clarify exactly what we're talking yeah. about. Don't they have to come to, oh, sorry. No. <laughs> Yes. Ma'am Chair, may yes. I go? Yes, you may. It's after that. I completely understand your dilemma and I support your efforts. So let's just say that. But don't they have to 
come to you to get a hookup anyway. Like, they already have a hookup for the house. No, I know, but to get that extension. Like, don't they have to come to you to get that extension to that that second unit? Let's not call it an accessory dwelling, right? Let's, you know, so it's my understanding that what your dilemma is, is that some builders or people may come forward to you and say that they're building a shed. And then all of a sudden they come back to you and say, oh, by the way, we want water and sewer service there because we put a bathroom there or whatever it is. And then you have difficulty assessing those fees. And it right, might, right? Uh, another situation that might occur that's you know more, more honest is uh, uh, the property may transfer or sell and the new owners coming into town may not be aware of the particulars of the sewer rules and regulations for what's an accessory structure, what is assessed an accessory fee. And the new owners are just looking to renovate or increase the value of their property and they may utilize that accessory structure to you know make it an apartment make it an in-law dwelling make it an office um, but because it's not properly defined they don't know they don't to know to ask that right. okay so then that leads me to my second question where is the definition of accessory dwelling where does that exist so the zoning bylaws so you should have a copy of it in your package. Yeah, no, no, I know. Yeah. I, I have that. I read it. So if it's in the zoning bylaws, isn't that a bylaw change to change no, the definition? The, the bylaw the definition remains I just wanna, the same. I don't want to do this and have it we come already, back and bite people us. Who, people who want to do an accessory dwelling from the get-go, go through the process, file with the planning board, pay the fee. Got that. The issue is those things that don't rise to the definition of accessory dwelling rather than try to rewrite the bylaw to catch every structure it's if you're putting in a new connection it's a new connection fee i mean we do have a situation right now where uh, one property has four dwellings on it they're all spaghetti lines and now the owner wants to subdivide the property well we're going to put an all brand new that's all new connection fees that's but right now they're all running off one meter from the house and it spaghetti's out to these these three other dwellings that are on the same piece of property. Um, so as Will said, someone says, oh, I'm just going to put a gonna put a big shed out there. I'm going to have a little workout room. I'll put a bathroom. Right. I'll put a gym. A couple of years go by. They sell the property. Someone else comes in and says, I, my parents are aged. I need a place to put them. They upgrade that. But they never come in for an accessory dwelling. It doesn't go back to the planning board. We're getting more water, we're getting more sewer. They've never paid a connection fee. We have no idea what that line looks like, what the use is. So right now it's just gonna be, if you're putting up a second building, or you have a second building, you wanna connect it to water and sewer, you're gonna pay some sort of connection fee. The water and sewer department's gonna be aware of what the piping is, what the connection looks like, and everything's all nice, done, and, and we get our revenues back, as opposed to what we're seeing now, where that's an accessory dwelling now, but it never, went through the process, just kind of morphed into an accessory dwelling over time. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, in my opinion, a backdoor to having an accessory dwelling without having to go through the permitting process with the planning board. And without having to pay the fee. Correct. Right. But Ms. Burbine. Okay. I think that we are making this a little bit more difficult than it needs to be. This is, in my opinion, this is not a backdoor. This is a backdoor to I disagree. And really turn that out to the building department. That when an individual comes in with a plan to get a permit from the building department to put up a garage or you know, some type of structure, that would kick off water and sewer May I have a follow-up question yes, to that? Of course, of course. So then I would think the planning board needs to edit their definition of how do I add an accessory dwelling to my house? Because in my opinion, that's how residents get confused because it clearly outlines that an accessory dwelling is also sometimes called an in-law apartment and can be rented to people and blah, blah, blah. So people aren't thinking that I understand exactly a simple. Saying, but it really goes back to the And I was present when the local was here and really talked about all of this. And the building department, the planning board, 
department felt that it was not an accessory apartment if it didn't have a stove. But then again, when you talk about there are very, very different ways to cook and prepare food. And in an accessory apartment, you are preparing food. But you can build a garage with the one down the road on Avenue that is separate from the house. It's supposedly a garage, but it has all the accoutrements of an apartment. There's another one three down the road. It was the same thing. It was permitted as a gym over a garage. So it's a policy thing. The building department doesn't have to be concerned about whether or not there's a stove in there. But the fact that it is a use. You are using this garage and you are adding water to it and you're putting in a bathroom. Okay, it's not an accessory apartment, but you are using it, therefore you should pay for it. That's the point. I don't think the bylaw, first of all, it's an excellent bylaw. It's one of the best in the state. I don't think it needs to be tweaked. It's just the building department when they issue a building permit, you need to clarify and tell the owner who's applying for this building permit. We have to check on sewer and have to check on water. So, why would anyone go through the process of applying for an accessory dwelling permit if you can morph yourself into it by putting in microwaves and I, agree. I mean, I agree. However, you still have to pay the fee. Right. Because it is a use. Right. So regardless of whether or not it becomes an accessory apartment, the use of this structure means you have to have to sewer and water. You can't just run it from your house. I know it's clear as mud. Well, where's, where, where's a copy of the, the policy that we're, we're editing? That's what I don't have. I don't know where we're editing. So I think this would be, be a new policy. Okay. All right. We have to draft right. it up yeah. for you. You can't vote on it as a policy. You can't vote on it tonight anyways. Okay. Your policy is on adopting policy, so you have to wait another meeting to vote on a policy. Yeah, because I don't even see, I mean, and that's the confusion, right? We don't even see what Bob sees to implement the current policy. So if we can see that, we can review it and vote on that edit well so if someone were to do one thing versus the other the the dwelling versus the accessory use are they equally are they equal in terms of the fees that you would have to pay or is there an advantage to the going in the back door fee. it's half it's a half connection fee. it would be half anyway for both that's her question. It would be for both, yes. So it would be advantageous to go in as a use versus a dwelling. Yes, because then you would skip that half fee. Well, so I'm just looking at what. Wait, wait, no. No. A dwelling is the same. Accessory dwelling is the same as what Ann's saying. If you did a new dwelling, that'd be different. But did you just say half? It's half. Yeah. So it's half for an accessory and it's half for... It'd be the same for a use or an that's accessory. What right. I'm, I, that's what I'm at. That's where I'm trying to get we, to. That's what we were asking for, just clarification. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. I, I just I, don't so want there to be a way to avoid the accessory dwelling, all the... There's a lot of, inform, a lot of restrictions. Yeah. And so right. if... If, if we let people go in the other way, I just... If you let them go in the other way, they'd still pay the fees, and, and they were like, they're liable to go in there now anyways. And then it would be up to the building department to say, all right, this is kind of tipped over here into a dwelling versus... It just clears, it clears up, and I, I agree with Ann, that the building sees it. They get the permit. If they put a permit and they want water and sewer, then they have to pay. Yeah. And there's no, there's no debating over whether what they're going to use it for. It's just, yep, you got to pay. So the confusing here is it says half sewer, but it it says 
Is it a full water? It would be half water also. Okay, so we've got to fix that in there. But more is right, we just got to get the piece of paper that says whatever policy we're going to agree to and close out close that loophole. Full water. Full water for an accessory dwelling? Yeah. Although we take them as a case by case basis. If it's a small addition to the existing house um, and all of the rest of the utilities are being used for it, I allow them to use water for that. However, if they if it's a separate dwelling, a separate unit, we require them to pay attention to and on the service. Um, and that's good for really the main reason for that is now with our, our new higher tier structure, if they don't do that, we're gonna end up with a lot larger bills. Right. Right. I would suggest that we try and wrap those both those things up in this policy. That so it's not you deciding whether it's kind of this way or kind of that way. It's the clearer we can make it for you, the easier as well. Although monetarily, you're right. If they want to keep it, they're just going to jump up a tier and pay the same amount anyways. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Any questions or comments from the audience? All of us. <laughs> and if I could just say, we brought town council in to try to make it less money. I know it's money, but um, we, we brought her involved to try to clarify. Right. Yes, yeah, she, uh, she was at the table. All right. Anything else? Anyone? So we're just waiting for a policy now we'll that we can pick up our. Yep. Right. So again, That's good. Change the word to use. Utes. We got it, Ann. Got it. Utes. Utes. There you go. Bye, Ann. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, yes, thank you for coming in. I think Kevin's up next. Yes? Yes. The water Kevin report. Sean, we will water we're gonna report. do some updates on where we are with some of the water and what's going on. Um, if anybody watch Jim's update. We're repeating a lot of the stuff that he had um, in his weekly update today, but we will, we will go forward. Um, first of all, I, I want to reach out and, and thank the Water Department, thank Sean, Eric, all the operators, all the guys and everything. They're doing a great job. Um, you know, we had a storm come up recently and people, you know, think more about what we're doing on the coast and what we're doing, but as soon as we started getting the weather reports and things were going up, Sean was talking to me and said, you know, I'm worried our reservoir's full and we started opening the gates to release water so that, you know, we weren't overflowing. As it turned out, I think we had 4.5 or 4.7 inches of water. Yep. And we had space for that water, but we still had water way over our elevation height. So that gets us nervous with all our dams, with the earth and dams. We've got the culvert at Old Oakton Bucket, which is supposedly the oldest culvert in the country. Um, and we were just releasing the water like crazy. I know between all of us, we spent a lot of time over the weekend coming in, checking on the dam and unclogging things and, and everything else to make sure that we had the water going. We also worked with some guys in the Historic Society. Um, where they have their mill, the grist mill, we opened that up too, and we were letting that flow completely just so we could get the water down. We were really worried about it overflowing and going up the road there and then damage it could cause, as well as people's houses. So, um, thank we you. We're working hard to take care of that, and, and they really did a good job. So, I want to thank mm -hmm. them for that and shot them as well. That being said, our Reservoir Attack Factory Pond, we are still 5.5 inches over its level, so we've got plenty of water, which is unheard of at this time. Um, treatment plants doing about 459,000 gallons per day. The wells are doing 858,000 gallons per day. Um, average demand is 1.3. Um, I talked about the rainfall. The actual number was 4.44 inches. Um, the construction projects are ongoing. The main focus has been to work on Old Open Bucket Road. We're trying to complete that. And the contract that has two crews on it, we kind of pulled the contractor back because they were going to start going through on Brook Street and start running that. But with Heritage Days and the summer still here, we held them off on that and put them both on old open market road just to slow them down a little bit because we didn't want to have that going on while everything's happening this summer. Um, in the near future, we found we have a broken well up 
on that well broken water gate over by the Lucky Finn on Front Street. So coming up in the very near future on a Monday or Tuesday night, we will probably be shutting the water off in that area late night and doing repairs and removing that well, that gate from service so that we can shut down Brook Street without taking everybody out or causing problems in the main line system. Um, Do you have to dig up the road? We will be digging up the road. So you'll put the steel, is it Front Street? It's on Front Street, we'll put steel plates on it. Um, what we'll probably do is dig it out, maybe that day or even that night, prep it all up, and we'll do a water shutdown probably that same night. Um, we'll work with some of the restaurants and everything else to make sure we're minimizing from the effect and um, turn that around and replace that. Um, we are not going to replace the gate, we're going to put a spool piece of pipe we're just worried it's going to blow apart sometime in the very near future, and we don't want that as a very point right from the press. Will there be brown water as a result of this work? We hope not, but we would always put out the alert that there could be brown water. Yeah. Um, you know, we'd like to say <coughs> no, but you know, we always any <coughs> time we disrupt the system. Yeah. Um, and what was the date of that, Kev? We don't have the complete date okay. yet. We're taking care of some other issues for us. Um, you know, on, on the bend at Hadley Road, we have a water leak that's been going across there for the longest time. We've had a hard time getting a contractor out there in doing the actual work. So what we're doing is we're going to bring the water contractors going to supply a crew to run some new drainage line there to get the water off the road because it's going to be just getting worse and worse. It's coming off that hill, and we're worried about what it's going to do in the winter. So we're going to redo the drainage in that area. Um, the only way we can get it done is by pulling pulling the water crews in there. They're good crews, they've got large crews, and we feel they can do the work successfully without causing any major problems. So that's uh, that's our hit list. So probably after that, we will then schedule to, to do the work on front street and try to minimize that as much as possible. Um, where was I? So as old open bucket's been going on, the, the main line's connected. One of the issues we've been having um, with the water department is all open bucket is one of the main lines that feeds the well uh, from the well from the treatment plant and everything else it goes up to the water tank we have the water tank at the top of maple street that water has been rerouted now and it goes down 3a and up maple the other way so we keep changing directions of where the water is that line will not be connected and complete until we can deactivate the old line that's in place there because we have to keep both lines active while we're switching the services on so that everybody has water. So that's causing some issues with our system. We also had some problems this weekend. The Greenbush area lost power. Um, we lost power to the treatment plant as well as quite a few, three of our wells. Now, it's not, it's one thing to lose power from the wells because we've got generators that kick on. We also had what we believe is probably some bad electricity. It didn't come in, it came in as dirty electricity because it, it screwed up our pump set our pump systems. We have our, the electronics weren't working properly in some of the pump systems in the water department as well we set those and that caused us some other problems this weekend. It was extremely um, frustrating. The way our pumps turn on is they start with a soft turn and they only turn to produce as much water as we need as opposed to the old fashioned ways of where they were on and off. So they're very sensitive and unfortunately when we get like dirty energy like that it does cause problems and then we lost power to it. But um, the guys get everything up and running again, but it was plus Labor Day weekend that this stuff happens. Do we know why we lost power? Was uh, one of the I'm not sure we had a couple of problems this weekend. Uh, one of them was two squirrels and a transformer. Can't make it up. Uh, no, it's true. Mm -hmm. Can't make it up. Um, Do we have generators at the water treatment? We have generators plant? at the wells, yes. What about the water treatment plant? Water treatment plant, we have generator yeah. also. Okay, good. Um, so that's ongoing. Um, as Jim has been talking about, and also Sean will say, um, manganese levels have been high because the amount of water that we have, for once it's working against us, and there's more um, organics in the water in the uh, reservoirs. Um, we are in the process of trying to get um, 17 and 18 up, but Sean's gonna get into that. I'm gonna let him, him take over. Is there any earthly use for manganese since we seem to have so much of it? 
you know, I think Sean's been trying to sell it to China and say it's I'm thinking element. somebody it must for electric <laughs> cars, but they haven't bought it yet. You know, we're, we're open to discussions over. It's completely it. useless stuff, huh? Yeah, it's, it seems to be. Oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, just some updates on current projects. Thanks for having me tonight, first of all. Um, 17 update, 17A, the green sand filter treatment plant is nearing completion. We are waiting for the power company to install the electric meter to begin testing all the equipment. We will then begin preparing for an inspection from the DEP. We hope to have this new plant online, hopefully this month in September, um, if not early October. It will bring up to 350,000 gallons of clean drinking water per day into the water system. Um, this will help reduce the burden on the, the surface water treatment plant, which would be really great. That's TAC Factory, right? That's TAC Factory, correct. Um, 18B, update a residuals disposal system for the existing treatment is nearing completion there. Um, the system will pump the backwash water from the treatment vessels to a settling tank over at Whittles Walk Golf Course. The clean water from this tank will then discharge into the pond to be reused for future irrigation. This well will bring up to 200,000 gallons of water per day into the water system, again helping to reduce the burden on the existing surface water treatment plant. Um, update on the new surface water treatment plant. We are currently in the piloting stages for the design of a new surface water treatment plant. The pilot study will simulate several different treatment methods to find the optimal treatment method for our surface water. There is a focus on manganese removal as well as TTHM or total trihalomethane removal, which our current treatment plant either lacks or struggles with. The study will be repeated in the winter to make sure that the treatment works in both warm environments and cold temperatures. A new surface water treatment plant will be a great benefit to the town. It will be able to produce a superior water quality with redundancy to ensure uninterrupted service. It will also allow us to be able to rest our groundwater wells in the winter or off season to give the aquifer time to recharge. Um, this is a very important factor for the longevity of our wells. So that's a, that's a really great thing. Um, one other final update, and that's the Dolan Well off the country way. Uh, pump test was performed on this site by Weston and Sampson, and a full report was submitted to the DEP for review. We are currently waiting to hear back from the DEP so we can proceed with construction. And when this well is completed, it could bring up to 400,000 gallons of water per day into the system. That's good. All very promising things. Um, one other update I need to give tonight is that, unfortunately, um, in August, we had another exceedance for total trihalomethanes. Um, it wasn't at the same location that it was at last year. It was at a different location. It was at the, um, the fire station off of First Parish Road. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, the fire station at First Parish. Uh, I, I, um, the fire... Uh, the fire department on First, first Parish? Off yeah, the, first the, parish. the level of chemicals were detected there. They were detected in a different location before. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I believe last year, uh, last year it was the Village Market, the exceedance last year. Um, and then just some, some general background on trihalomethanes or TTHMs. Um, they're a disinfection byproduct. All water systems that add chlorine or disinfect their water have to test for them. Uh, TTHMs form when free chlorine reacts with naturally occurring organic matter um, <coughs> in the water. And it's time sensitive. The longer the water is out in the system, the more these um, disinfection byproducts build up. So the older the water is, the, the more THMs are gonna have. So one of four samples taken on, <coughs> excuse me, on August 3rd came back at 82 parts per billion. As a reference point, <coughs> one part per billion is equivalent to one penny in $10 million. So yeah, I don't know if you mentioned, Sean, maybe I missed it. Um, the limit is 80 parts per billion, and it came back at 82. 82. That was gonna be my question. Okay. Um, but because of this exceedance, uh, I do have to send out a public notice to the residents explaining what TTHMs are um, and what the sample result was. It contains uh, language required by the DEP, but there's also 
educational material included in there as well. Um, and it's important to note that the 82 parts per billion is what's called a, a locational running annual average, or LRAA. Um, that's because the DEP allows all systems to average four quarters of sampling, and that's what your number is. So the actual number at that location was quite a bit higher, it was 130. That was the actual result for that location. But it's also important to note that it all depends on where our surface <coughs> water travels versus where our groundwater travels in the system, since we're a blended system. Because uh, our ranges um, were from 6.2, so single digit, 6.2 to 130. So if it, it's all, I mean, it, it, it's a, sort of a, a mystery that I've always wish you could solve by putting like a dye or, or something in the water to trace how the water works or where it goes. Um, and I usually I get a lot of questions after this notice will go out and everyone wants to know, does their house have it? Yeah, right. And it's hard to answer that question as hydraulics change, flow changes, as Kevin mentioned, construction projects change the way the water goes through town. Um, and then also, after we shut the plant off at night, all night long, the wells run, and that shifts where everything's going as well. What was the date of that? Because I think it's important, too, when you send out um, your public notice that you may not get that notification until 30 days later. Because I do remember last year when this happened, we got a lot of pushback as to why we didn't notify residents sooner. So I think if we include in our communication why you can't, because you don't get the test back for X amount of days or whatever. So that would be my only suggestion okay. to make sure folks understand that you're notifying them as soon as you were aware. We did revise the notice quite a bit from the last one that went out, um, from lessons learned and from, honestly, from looking at other water systems um, that have surface water. I looked at their websites and looked at some of the violations that they had posted. Um, and uh, took some pieces from other other departments. So, Sean, what what could you have done to have this not occur? That's a good question. Um, it, the rain this this summer's weather has been a blessing and a curse. Um, we've consistently gotten rainfall, so we haven't had to pump nearly as much water out of the surface water treatment plant as we have in previous years. However, the organics in the water are almost twice as high as they were a year ago. Um, we know this from the testing that we do every, every month, raw water and finished water at the treatment plant. And my chief operator in over 10 years has never seen the numbers that we're seeing now. He on rare occasions would see a teen number, maybe a 13 or, or 14. We're in the low 20s right now. So just to, to explain, that's that's the organic content of, of the water, how much organics are in the water themselves that they're treating. And the treatment plant's actually been doing pretty good because I think you were telling me it's between 73 and 80, 83% removal. Yeah, they require that you, as far as your organics go, the monthly sampling I was just talking about, all surface water plants have to have at least 50% removal. Um, for the month of August, we had 76% removal. For the month of July, we had 81% removal. The average citizen is going to get that note and they're going to say that my water is toxic, right? There's something in there that I don't want my kids drinking. And what's our reply to how, again, how could, did we use too much chlorine? Did we not use enough chlorine? Like if you knew that that was going to happen, could you have changed the way we process water so that we stayed below that limit. Unfortunately, the way that the, the plant is flawed by design, um, meaning we have two spots where we, we, ent we, we put in chlorine to kill viruses and to kill anything in there. Um, that's the first place it goes in is in the sedimentation basins. And that's not where you should ever be putting chlorine. Um, that's because that's where all your organics are. That's where you're trying to get everything to settle out. So by design, the plant is flawed. Now, 
when the organic level, organics are lower, we can stay in compliance. We just had such a spike that um, after our, our last um, MCL violation last year, we installed tank mixers in both tanks to help um, mix the water and it helps to aerate it. And because Charlie Hill methanes are a, a VOC, they'll disperse into the air. Um, and that helped us greatly. The previous three quarters, um, we were not in any violation. Our numbers were very good. Um, this quarter, August, is, is always the hardest month for surface water treatment plants. Can I, can I say something on that also, Sean? Yep. So one of the things, Tony, that we're, we're looking at doing and we're talking about scheduling is changing our organic carbon. We have carbon that runs through a filtration system. Typically, the carbon can last five to seven years. I think we're on I'm probably about... We did it in 2017, a full replacement. So we did a full replacement less than four years ago. We're planning on doing it again. We're going to do the carbon earlier. The carbon does a great job of filtering everything and getting it out uh, in carbon deteriorates at the time. We're going to do that early and um, see how that works also with the with filtering any of that stuff out. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, but again, what 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 do we what happened and what like is this just every time we get a lot of rain and the water gets warm and a lot of stuff grows in it, we this, should this expect this? This rain this year, yeah. It, uh, like I said, my chief operator had never seen numbers like this before. To give you an idea, um, in 2020, it was 11.5 milligrams per liter. July 2020, July 2021, 21.2. Um, in August 2020, it was 11.6 milligrams per liter. August 2021, 21.7. The, the numbers are so large that even though we're getting pretty, pretty good removal rates given the age of our treatment plant, 76% removal, there's still enough getting out into the system that it's reacting with chlorine and making these disinfection byproducts. So. Yeah. Having seen that the, the numbers, the numbers come in for the total organic carbon before you get your THM results on the same month, and I'm I'm pretty surprised we didn't violate in more locations, given the numbers I see. Is is part of the answer that we? It's the answer is we need a new water treatment plant. That is the answer. Yep. Right, because uh, That's what tell me if I'm wrong, but if you had yep. a DAF system, if we yep. had this years ago, we would this problem would go away. Yep. So if we build a new system, this problem goes away. Yep. The mag and we'd finally be able to filter out manganese yep. at or which we don't. So that problem would go away. Correct. So the answer is we need a new water treatment place. And the town of Falmouth, um, who used to violate every quarter, they violate the THM. Uh, MCL. We toured, Jim and Kevin and I toured their new uh, surface water treatment plant. After they brought that online and they flushed their system, they have single digit TTHMs in the system now. Yeah. I mean, I agree with what Andrew's yeah. saying, but that's five years away. Mm -hmm. right. right. So what are we going to do for the next five years? The carbon will help us um, for the coming year. It may be something that we have to do more often. Um, we also have money uh, to put more advanced mixing systems in our tanks. Um, that got appropriated. We haven't been able to do it yet because to do it properly, you should take the tank offline. And you all know we have a problem taking the tank offline here in situ. So um, I am working with them to see if they can do it on, while it's online, but it's, it's going to be more expensive. Well, my fear is you're going to be over this number. If you just had the high quarter now and it's a four quarter rolling average, you're going to be next, dropping off loan numbers and keeping that high number. The, so next, you, the, the next time we sample is in November, um, and by then usage will be down and we'll have two more groundwater sources online. So I would expect that we'll be back in compliance in November because we're going to have lower numbers. Right, but will the average be in compliance? That's the question, is whether, we'll, whether the average, because it's an 82, the last uh, violation, we were in 88, and we were able to get that down the following quarter. 
So in 82, I'm hopeful that we can get that number down as well and be back in compliance. Yeah, yeah this, this is to the, back to the treatment plan. I don't know if you want to stay on this before we, so I mean, could, could you say more, how is that going? Is there, have there been issues that have come up? Are we still on track with? We're or, moving along. They, okay. they we're still with the DAF system. They said it's one of the dirtiest waters they've ever encountered. And they dirtiest? Said, yes. Dirtiest coming Thank out you. of the reservoir and they, with, with the quantities of manganese. They said um, the, the DAF system may not be applicable because of the amount of manganese that's in the well, we may have to do some, uh, or in the, not in the wells, in the uh, reservoir itself that's coming out from the water that we're seeing now. They may have to come up with some hybrid ideas where it's more traditional and might incorporate some data, or it's still kind of fluid on what they're doing with the testing. So, um, they're testing how many different types of filtration? It's um, six different weeks where they were going to do different scenarios of treatment. Um, they've paused it now because we're waiting for some different equipment to come in so that we can pilot some uh, uh, settlers, tube settlers. Uh, basically, in the time they, they came out and they took six buckets of our raw water to take to their, back to their lab to uh, test it. And then fast forward three weeks when they started building and constructing and piloting, our water, the color of our water went from low 100s to up into the 400s in color. And the water became vastly different in that time period due to rainfall and um, organics coming in from uh, runoff. Vastly worse. Yes, vastly worse. And uh, they didn't expect that, but they still tried to see if they could get the DAF to work, and they were just unable to get, they were able to get it to work, but they weren't confident at that, that high of a load that this was a good direction to continue going. Are they gonna be able to make the determination if they can do a passive type system from this as well? That, that's it's still that's the goal. What that's what they're telling us, that they could still work with it. And they will also see, we have another round of tests to do in the, um, in the winter. In winter time. Right, okay. Comparison. Um, and that's why we're doing the pilot testing now. And when they do the pilot test and come up with their conclusions, that also has to be the, 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 right, so the passive should really, okay. All right, I was just, okay. I have a question. I know you've told us this in the past, but what percentage of our water supply comes from the reservoir and what percentage comes from the wells? Nice, easy questions. Anybody have a calculator really handy? Yes. Um, Nancy's going to do it in her head. Okay, so Nancy, give me that. One third comes from the treatment plant, two thirds come from the well. So we have 450,000 gallons per day from the treatment plant. The wells are pumping out 850,000 gallons. Currently? Currently, as of yesterday. Okay. So I guess you take 459 divided by 1,317 and that will be another one. So. Okay. I, and the reason why I was asking that is just because of the ink. If they said that it's the dirtiest water they've seen coming from the reservoir, right? It's not that same presence isn't everywhere in the wells correct that's, that's pre-treatment we get we right get no 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 i know it's pre-treatment but that's yeah. and that's where yeah. my head is going right like what's causing that is it the rainwater? is it the terrain in the reservoir right because it comes it's, from natural resources and just curious because our inlet is in old oak and bucket pond and not really coming from our reservoir. Mm -hmm. um, most surface water treatment plants pull from the reservoir. We're kind of different in that we release the water from the reservoir down into old oak and bucket pond. So it's getting dirty from the old oak and bucket pond. It's getting dirty as it comes down. I've so taken samples coming right out of the reservoir and then I've taken a sample in the river coming down and then obviously our raw water and you can just see it deteriorate as it comes down. So is our goal to have a more direct access just to the reservoir? That's part of the, the design That's study as well, as looking into a, a whole a a second in. intake. And we kind of, you know, I don't want to speak for Sean and correct me if you disagree, but I, I kind of think we did it to ourselves because when we took that factory pond offline from going directly into the system, we knew that well had heavy iron and manganese. It pumped all over the bucket 
It was always manganese sand, but that was also a source of additional manganese for 20 or 30 years of pumping that water into it. Maybe 30 years? 30 years? Yeah. Yeah. 30 years they took that water. If I could give you just a, an example. And when people go by there, you saw it look like uh, the Grand Rapids going down there with the water. That's, from the releases. It was, it was that's a lot of water going into the system. Thanks, Sean. Well, the sooner we get that done. Yeah. Thank any, you, Sean. Any other questions, observations? Thank you. For Thank everything. you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You know, we could go on and on talking about water for the rest of the night. Yes, we could. And we'll have Will the back. The news is a plan is in the works. So the next meeting we'll have Will back to give us an update on our Oceanside I and I study. So okay. we have that ready. Great. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Sean. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Nancy's back. Debt management of capital needs. So I will give the board three options. One, we can move forward with the presentation. <coughs> Two, we can delay the presentation because you had three meetings this week. And three, you have the option of doing everything else in your agenda and circling back to the presentation at the end because you're running ahead. What is the board's question? Meantime, I will start the presentation assuming you will be the first. How long is the presentation? Uh, it's debt, so I would love to talk about debt, so we're talking 30 to 45 minutes, depending on your input as well. And then we just move down to two or three. You can just tell them what's in this. Appreciate that. So this is a 45 minute presentation. I think with your questions, yes. It's up to you. It's 30 we, slides, it's in depth. All right, we, we do have two more meetings this week and I thank you for- Options? Yes. Um, is there any um, pressing need to nope. do it tonight? The I, I'm a little hesitant to put it, put it off. It's quarter of nine. Um, we don't have a lot left after that other than assigning the town meeting article so i guess it depends on how the rest of the board feels about it we're going to be in meetings two hours at least tomorrow night two hours at least on um thursday night and then we have an extra meeting next week for voting so and we have the retreat coming up and one of the reasons we put it on this meeting was so that you would have it for the applicability to the financial policies mm -hmm. for that discussion, but you mm -hmm. have the presentation in their backup, so you could right. just look through it mm -hmm. and see some of the, the data that's in there that would that um, o that overlaps with the financial policies. So I just don't want to kill you knowing that your week is going to be a tough one as it is. Reader's Digest version, I think, would be nice, but yeah. just to, to know a little bit more. But I don't want to. I can give you the highlights in 10 minutes. Well, I was just going to say, it might be useful to do that, and if the board wouldn't mind, not asking really complicated questions. Tony, Mara, where's Karen Canfield? Yeah. Andrew, I mean, I, I think that's what I would like to see. Let's just go through it, yeah. but not get into. Yeah. Then we can ask questions at the 921 meeting. Right. Or whatever, whatever that one is. Well, I would suggest we've all looked at the slides, so you don't need right. to read everything on every slide. Yeah. And even if we get 15 minutes through it, it's 15 minutes less than a Correct. later meeting. Correct. So you got 15 minutes. Okay. Use it wisely. <laughs> so um, tonight we're just going to take a very uh, quick spin through our current uh, situation as it r pertains to our overall debt perspective. The last time we did this was in April of 2009 for those who are watching at home. Uh, one of the things we are going to touch on is financing for the water treatment plant options and impacts. Um, so this is just how our debt breaks down. Right now we have about $119 million outstanding in principal. We expect to pay down $9 million this year, so we have a rapid amortization. And this is when it will all be fully retired. So all of the $119 million that's currently outstanding will be fully retired, meaning paid off by fiscal 41 
Um, and in some enterprise funds, such as the Golf Enterprise and Transfer Station Enterprise, Waterways Enterprise, and the CPA Fund, which did the athletic fields, those will be paid off in fiscal 31, so just less than 10 years from now. Uh, this is just a nice graphical representation if at this time of night you prefer to look at pie chart rather than chart. Uh, it, but sometimes people ask the question, okay, that's principal, but what about the interest? Well, this is the same information just showing you the interest as well, which is $156 million. And that's why we encourage the rapid amortization of debt so that we incur less interest costs. Uh, the only thing I do want to call out to you in the, uh, in the top two pale blue lines, debt exclusions outside tax levy limit as compared to general fund within tax levy limit. The, the difference between the two is the debt exclusions are those that um, town meeting voted at town meeting, voters voted at town meeting, and then went to the ballot and voted to have these particular um, repayments for these projects outside of the limitations of Prop 2.5. So that's what that means. It's within the uh, limitations of Prop Position 2.5 or outside. Mm -hmm. So just what are some of the fund debt statistics? Because it's fun to have debt statistics. Um, the dollars per capita um, based on our current population, the percentage of the fiscal 22 budget. So when we talked about the financial policies, this is one of the key things we um, wanted to focus on is when we look at level of debt, if you look at the percentage of the budget as debt services percentage of budget is very high for sewer and water enterprise, higher than what we've seen in other people's sample financial policies. And the reason being and why the, the, needs, the need to customize our financial policies to our um, situation is that we're making major investments in our infrastructure and our financial policies have to re reflect that. So that's the only reason I want to bring that out to you. And then just a percentage, the, the dollar value of the average bill. So of the average um, water and sewer bill that we just voted those rates for, about 49% of that is going to debt service, which is going to the improvements in the system. So what about... Um, when is all of this debt coming off? We had that earlier slide showing that it was between fiscal 31 and fiscal 41. In five years from now, 60% of our debt will be retired. In 10 years, almost 86%. And then in 15 years, 98%. So even though it runs to fiscal 41, in 15 years, 98% of all that debt will be retired. So that's something Good. interesting to look at, especially when you look at that big number of 119,000. Keep in mind that 9 million that we're retiring this year. We're, we have rapid, am, rapid amortization for a reason, um, and this is one of the reasons why. Uh, what are we borrowing our money for in, uh, in the general fund? This is just the breakdown of the current debt that's outstanding, and some of this has been outstanding for a number of years. We try not to borrow in the, um, in the last few years for equipment or vehicles. Um, and the ESCO is the, the largest, followed by foreshore protection, and then school buildings, equipment, and fields um, wrap that up. Did we, did we use the ESCO, though? Because I know we put money in it. We're on the very last bit. It's just a little over a quarter of a million dollars that's left of that full $5.9 million. Okay. And that's the, um, the, the bottom of this building, basement, that that project's ongoing. Uh, again, just a pie chart if you get a little tired and want to look at pretty colors, put it in there. So what's left that's outstanding right now that's been authorized? Not that much. We have the $2 million authorization for um, seawalls and uh, foreshore protection. That's from 2015. That's never been allocated. That was a, a petition. So that's our, like our safety uh, allocation. We have the FEMA foreshore design of $3.5 million, which we only expect to issue another $500,000 because that's our 25%. We had to approve the full amount, but we only expect to use the 25% of it. Um, the septic loan program, which is supported by governments. And then um, the land acquisition that Jim spoke to at the beginning of the meeting, which has just been completed, uh, that's uh, outstanding. So probably about another $1.85 million we'll be uh, issuing between the, the items in red. And then South Shore Votech, um, after we took our vote at town meeting uh, to authorize the $18.9 million, the South Shore Votech School Committee voted to reduce that amount to 10.5. We do not have to take a subsequent vote. But our liability for that it will go down, and our liability is only 7%. Plus that's considered overlapping yeah. debt. Um, what are some of the Different. big things that are coming down the line? Um, on the general fund, it's going to be the FEMA subsidized uh, foreshore st storm damage repairs. We still have four open disasters. They are all um, in very active states of design, engineering, and in some cases, construction. Um, but it's not all going to hit at the same time. This is going to hit probably over the next two to seven years as these things make their way through different uh, permitting and design area uh, levels. 
And then we have the um, Oceanside Area Seawall Replacement. I know Kevin's working on that, and we're having a meeting tomorrow to look at some grant possibilities for, the, for any of these projects. So that's something that um, is a lot of money that's coming, becoming available in FMA flood mitigation assistance, as well as in a brick program, um, which is bringing resiliency to infrastructure, and a couple of other uh, FEMA-related grant programs that we've had good luck with in the past. Madam Chair, can I ask you a question? And Jim, can we have them come before us in the next couple of meetings yeah, to give us an update that. on the all the pressure of people? Just, no, Kevin and, and the, uh, our new Why, coastal. Me being on the call every single two weeks for like the last officer. seven years? FEMA. <laughs> no, no, I, but I was meaning the projects that would be funded. Yeah, and not even just FEMA, but yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. always I tell when Nancy's on. Yeah. I can always tell when Nancy's been on a FEMA call. Her eyes just go <laughs> blank. And, it's a special yes. kind of joy. Yeah. Um, so, look, here are our FEMA PWs. Yes. These are all of the storms and all of the. Um, uh, these are the FEMA PWs. There you go. Just so you can see it on a, uh, a map. Our, the problem that we have is when you see the same color, uh, this same area in all different four, all different columns. That's a problem. FEMA does not do well with things coming from different pots, and that's why most of our projects have installed. We had repetitive loss on similar structure, on the same structure, maybe in different areas, and it's not easy to try to design that when it's so much for this storm, so much for that storm, and we are working with them to deal with that. And so, just, so those are all just different projects that are, you are all going or all finished now? None of them are finished, no, 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 except no. for Egypt Beach. And Egypt Beach is done. Um, and then the Peggotty Beach PW397 is almost done. The rest of these are all open projects that are in current levels of design and engineering and permitting. Should get that. So I'll Egypt block. Beach was So the, this is the actually a liability. This is, we're going to have to pay 25% of those projects when they come. And you're probably looking at a minimum of 20 million. But they will not come all at once. There's just no way. Like Third Cliff has been on and off town meetings with authorizations. And we're still doing modeling for that to um, satisfy CZM. So this is just what a graph of what our debt looks like. Um, it's, as you can see, the rapid amortization, the uh, red line of those two projects we just spoke about and how they fill in. And what we'll do in that fiscal 22-23 is smooth that out so that we don't have that bump in there. So when we retire debt, we backfill it with a new projects so we don't lose the ability to um, maintain our capital plan. So that's just me showing you if I moved, if we, if Cam and I, when we work on, when we issue this debt, if we moved those red lines out by one year, that creates a gap in fiscal 23. I could use that gap to help pay down the items in red so that I have less of an impact going forward. So it, it's very interesting for structure, very boring for you at 9 o'clock at night. So moving on. Um, this is just, we're going to go really quickly through the different enterprise funds. This is Widow's Walk and what's going to be going on with it um, with the additional 770000 Everything was good. We added the 770000 at the last town meeting so we could do the parking lot and uh, finish the clubhouse improvements. What we want to do now is mitigate that impact of that 770000 on their debt. See how it, in fiscal 24, 25, depending on when that goes out, it starts to bring it up above the level where we want it. So we wanted to start looking at, as we roll that note, making payments on it to get it back down where we find it to be a manageable level. And again, you can see the impact of the irrigation system if that were to hit in 32, 33. So now that we know the impact, we can start planning for how we can make that a more manageable impact. Transfer station enterprise, uh, we have a loader that's outstanding. Um, it had retired all of its debt, now it's picked some up because of the yard jockey. Um, and we have a backhoe that's proposed for October STM. None of this is <coughs> anything new. It was all on the capital plan. Some of it's just moving a little <coughs> bit faster. And again, this is an enterprise fund that maybe we don't necessarily want it to, we would prefer to pay in cash. Um, depending on when our retained earnings get certified, we may be able to do that with the backhoe and we wouldn't have to bring it on as a debt item. Sewer enterprise, you can see the wrapper amortization that that has going on, the blue line. And these are the projects that are outstanding currently, and there are certainly more projects on the plan that will start to fill in. But there's a lot of, excuse me, availability in their debt service based on the current levels that they can bring projects on and support them. Water Enterprise, the, 
Water Enterprise also has some retirement of debt, but because there's been so much infrastructure brought on so quickly, um, and all of it was necessary, their level of debt doesn't retire at the same level as the sewer department, so their debt picture just continues to get bigger, uh, larger and larger, and which is what the board knows from the rate um, discussions we have, because we're increasing rates because of our debt service, and this is what it looks like. Um, but it's all necessary improvements that need to be made. Uh, Waterways has declining debt. They don't really have a lot on their um, five-year capital plan as yet that would fill this in. They've been <coughs> trying to do most of their things, uh, most of their projects with cash, as well as they've been very successful with their grant programs. So the biggest thing they have going on right now is a million-dollar dock replacement, and they're uh, looking for a grant to cover 75 to 80 percent of that. Uh, the current debt exclusions, this is always in the, everyone's mind. There's um, 62 million outstanding. Those are the years they retire. Those are the projects. So the senior center, 10 million of it has been borrowed. Um, it will be on the tax bills this year. Uh, what we have currently outstanding is 8.8 .8 million. So we got a really large cash premium. So that helped reduce it. So even though we borrowed 10, we only have to pay back 8.8. .8. This is what our debt exclusions look like in a graphical format. So as you can see, there, there's a little bit of choppiness there, and um, see in 20 and 21 how it dropped. We've discussed with the board in 2019 if we borrow the senior center in two pieces to try to level it out, or if, if the board would prefer to give taxpayers a little bit of a break, and the board was more in favor of giving taxpayers a little bit of a break. So that's why you see it level out, and then it kind of pumps up in 22, and that's the senior center coming on as one lump. Um, so the impact of the major school project, I think, is on everyone's mind is it's going to be on special town meeting. Um, right now, the, we would hope to cover the feasibility study excuse me, um, out of cash and other available articles. There would still need to be a bidding process and a construction process if it gets accepted to MSBA further on, and then the voters accept whatever project comes forward. So you're still looking at with think three to five years out before you'd actually be borrowing money. You might have an approved project if one comes forward, but you wouldn't necessarily be borrowing money where you'd have to repay that. So that gives us some time to re, uh, reduce that schedule. Based on an $85 million school project, which was the estimate from that study a few years ago, it doesn't mean that's the same thing that's going to come out of this particular MSBA feasibility study. And based on the same reimbursement rate that Gates got, which I don't know if we are going to get exactly the same amount, we're looking at a town share of about 47.6. So a couple of unknowns there, but just to give you an idea, if you financed it over 25 years, which was how the middle school was done, it would be about an estimated impact of 9,254 in current, based on current data. If you went only 20 years, there would be about a $700 savings, which is that, that interest savings. People would have a, a, a larger impact but they would pay less in um, interest. Can I ask her one question? Sure. I know you don't really want to ask her, no, ask her right. questions. I'm, I'm going real quick. Did you I'm have, almost done. Did you have, the, I, I was just trying to go back to your chart. Did you have the potential water treatment plant debt on your chart? You didn't, right? I might I was looking have. at the colors. I didn't see. No, these are existing ones. I do have it coming up. OK. Uh, let's see. Oh, and here we are. But you had that as a debt exclusion? Well, I have it two ways. I, this, this is part of our discussion. We have like three slides that I'm going to go really quickly about. Uh, so the other uh, major enterprise capital project that isn't approved but is on the five-year plan would be a new water treatment plant. Early estimates of $40 million, as, again, as the board knows, but maybe some people at home don't know, it, the design contract was only awarded two meetings ago. So this is the, the design is ongoing. And as Sean just said, there's a lot of things they need to do to decide what type of plant we need and how to cite it before they can get a real good feeling for the price. Mm -hmm. um, this is a potential eligible use of the ARPA funds. We already have $900,000 of ARPA funds. We should get another 900000 and we are waiting to find out what Plymouth County is going to do with the rest of the ARPA funds that they claimed as a county. Oh. Um, they said that they would That's roll good. out a plan by the end of July. We still haven't heard anything yet, so we don't know if it will be based on population, if it's going to be an application process, or if they're planning to do something else with the money. So we have yet to find out. We also have the Clean Water Trust that we could go through. Um, again, some potential FEMA grants or other resiliency grants that may come out of the infrastructure plan. And there's two different ways to fund this, on the water rates or as a debt exclusion. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that a enterprise fund project was done as a debt exclusion. We just retired in fiscal 21 the sewer plant upgrades. So what's the difference? These are the pros and cons for water rates. Um, my estimate for a uh, 
based on the fiscal 21 rates, I didn't update for this for the fiscal 22 rates, was a 39% increase for the first year that this debt would hit. So that's a huge increase on the water rates if it was to be financed that way, depending on the cost. And like I said, there's lots of grant programs, ARPA funds that we would want to um, apply to this. On the tax rate, this personally is my preferred method of process of um, dealing with this, financing this debt because water is basically the same pool. It's not like um, some of the other, like sewer, there's a smaller number of sewer users. Pretty much everyone uses water unless they have a well. So whether it's on the tax bill or whether it's on the water rates, it's still coming out of the same pocket for most people. What I like about the tax, the debt exclusion, is that it can be used as a deduction on people's income taxes. It can be, um, if people have mortgage, mortgages and they have escrows, this now makes it a monthly payment rather than part of their uh, coming up with it as uh, once a quarter water bill. Um, elderly residents would, could defer all a portion of their real estate taxes. Based on what's on the special town meeting, the um, elderly residents could now potentially also defer water, their water charges as well, so that would be a pro on the other slide now, if that passes. Um, a change in usage behavior would not result in additional increases, so it would be based on the value of your home. So it goes either way. If it were, the cons would be that it would have to be approved by voters at a town meeting and have to go to a ballot. So that it's another, it's another step to get that approval. Um, but again, it's just another way of, that's another discussion for a, a further discussion to have when we talk about that project when it comes further comes forward as construction. This is what that schedule would look like um, for the debt exclusions. If we had a school, uh, an elementary school of 80, 47 million plus or minus, and a water treatment plant, you would see a major jump in your debt exclusions. But you're going to have a major jump with a water treatment plant in the water rates or the debt exclude on the taxes, um, and you would have a major um, jump in your taxes if you do an elementary school. There just isn't enough retirement with what we have out there to really absorb it. So uh, I did want to bring that one forward, but I do want to end on a happy note. So I wanted to give you an update on the Senior Center. So in 2019, when we talked about this, I estimated the Senior Center impact um, to the average tax payer at the time would be about $2,230. Right now, we've issued $10 million um, in a bond last year, and we have $2.2 million on a short-term note. So far, the impact based on the current fiscal 21 value is 1,433. <laughs> um, if we were to issue the whole 2.2 million um, as a, that's out in a, a note right now as a bond, that would be an additional impact of 383. So that would still be well below what we uh, initially estimated in April 2019. But we do have, against that 2.2 million, we have $242,000 in gifts that have already been received that can go against that. We have the sale of the mine at fire station, and we are still waiting for the final cost of the senior center project because it had uh, planning board conditions in it for a parking study for six months that it might need additional, a park, an additional parking area. It's going to be a while before that project closes out and we have final costs. So, and we'll have this discussion closer to a time when it comes for that December ban to mature, whether the board wants to roll that ban and not um, issue it as a bond to try to give it more time to retire, because we also have the discussion about the senior center, old senior center, what to do with that, um, depending on what the board decides after the old mine, mine at fire station sells. That's great news. Is that variance just due to us estimating the interest rates too higher than they are? Um, it, it, interest rates and the value of the town went up and the average value of the house went up so things moved around a little bit so we always want to estimate on the high side and come in low and not be going in the other direction i mean we got a huge cash premium on that like you saw we issued 10 and we're only paying back 8.8 so um i won't go over the summary slides you can read them at your leisure so that was i think i think i did in 18 minutes good job awesome Thank you. Thank you. Ready to take the test, folks? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. Appreciate it. So, on to old business. Discuss vote assigned special town meeting articles. Jim, are you with us? I'm still here. How would you like to go through it? You have a recommendation in here. 
as to what's up, what's on. Yep. Um, some recommendations that you might want to delay votes, Article 4 on the Hadley School feasibility, uh, Article 5, the capital improvements until capital budget meets. Again, these are up to you. Uh, the planning board is having their public hearing on the petition articles Thursday. Uh, so they'll be coming in, so you might want to wait and have a discussion with them. In Article 6, community preservation, we still haven't heard what they're going to be doing, particularly on the Border Street project. I guess they're hearing something on Monday night. That's what it looks like. I think what's going to come up on that, just from what I've been hearing, is that they might fund a portion of it, and then it'll be up to the board. If you decide you want to exercise your option, how we're going to come up with the balance. Well, that remains to be seen, what we actually can or can't do. There seems to be questions floating around about that. What was this for? Sorry. The Border Street land what we can and can't do, uh, depending on the appraisal and depending on what kind of private fundraising there is. And there is a question as to if the difference between the appraised value and the offer that they've currently got on the table is such that CPC can't pay over the appraised value, but there's an offer on the table for $2.3 million, where's that other money going to come from? And it seems like it would be all right, apparently, if it were to come through private fundraising. But there seems to be a question as to whether or not the town would be allowed to use other town funds. That just sort of came my way today. Well, and we've already talked about this. Um, in terms of the appraisal, there's no appraisal necessary on this property. Well, they have one. And if I just, under normal circumstances, if the town was looking to purchase a piece of property, we went and said, we want to buy that piece of property over there, or someone wanted to sell that to us, we have to go through an appraisal process, and that determines the value that we can place on that property. This is a 61A. That doesn't apply. The value is what the offer is for the highest and best use under current zoning. Okay, what does that mean? If they were selling this for $10 million because they were going to put a 40B, that's not the highest and best use under zoning, so you wouldn't pay that. But the 2.3, that is the value. The CPC can pay that if they choose. They are not restricted by that appraisal value. However, they don't believe it's worth what they're asking, so I don't think they're going to put up the $2.3 million. The town can use a mixture of methods to pay for it, we can't take private donations, right. uh, we can borrow, we can use cash, or the town has the option to say, okay, um, Group X, the town is going to put up this much money and we are assigning the, the option to purchase to you. Right. Go get the money, let us know how it works out. Um, that, is a, that is an option, but um, the whole appraisal value on a 61A doesn't apply. And I've spoken to council and she's opined on that and we've provided that to the CPC. But well, we'll see what happens on Monday night. Yep. So I would suggest that that has to be delayed as well. Does anyone have anything to say about the articles that we would want to assign tonight? So Unpaid bills, budget. Why are we signing them now? Well, that's what is on the agenda. Discuss, discuss vote, assign special town meeting articles. Did I read that wrong? No, I just don't know why we're doing it. Usually we don't do it this early. Well, it's... It's not as early as you think it is. Town meeting's end of October, so... I mean, typically the chair does the unpaid bills. So that's fine. Budget reconciliations, is that usually the chair? Is that just moving money between departments, Nancy? Yes. Yeah. I don't think we're raising additional money, are we? We are on enterprise funds. Yeah, enterprise funds. So we would be for yeah, it's just all those reconciliations.
I don't really have any preference. I'll do whatever. So All right. I'm happy to. Oh, there's nine of them? I'm happy to. Total articles, I believe there's 11 total articles. 11? 11. Two of the petitions. And generally, I think the petitioner would present those. So, but there's uh, six that we would ask you to vote to support tonight. One, two, three, seven, eight, nine. That's it. One, two, three, seven, eight, nine. Support those six. Uh, you can assign all the rest of them if you want. It's up to you, but at least to vote to support those six articles. So I'm seeing six motions assigning articles. And does that mean we would not assign the other articles tonight? That would be yeah. entirely up to you. You wouldn't vote on them tonight because you're not ready, but you could assign them if you want. But you might want to wait because some might say, I'm not sure I support that. I want to hear more right. about it. Well, I don't have a problem waiting. Does anyone else care? No. Wait for Karen to be here. All right. All right. I mean, we're all going to do two what? or three. Yeah. So. Right. yeah. All right. All right. I don't think you have to assign tonight. Nancy, you want to vote tonight. They don't have to assign who's going to speak. You want us to vote them without assigning them. Is that what you yeah, want? Yeah, we do that all the time. Well, I, oh, I'm just would, asking. I can, it would be helpful if the board would just tell us if there's anything they want to change because if I agree to these holding their meeting just to know what things are going to change in the work. So I know that there were questions about the reserves are so great. So if there's just anything in probably Article 2 or 3 that the board doesn't want on there or wants to change, I just, that would be the only thing I would just want to know from the board. You know, the, your recommendations and your assignments we certainly need to put off. It's just that the other committee can get going. Mm -hmm. They can't get going unless we get going? Well, you don't want them to opine on making a transfer to the OPEP liability trust fund if the board is not going to support that transfer to the OPEP liability trust fund. And that's one of the items that the board did discuss that they perhaps wanted to have further discussion about. So those transfers to reserves, I think, are probably the biggest thing. I don't think on the or anything, I don't think the budget reconciliation, unless there's something on there that's calling to the board's attention about an issue, um, that they would change anything. The only thing that I have heard the board say is um, that they wanted to talk about what is the transfer to reserves. So the uncontroversial, therefore potentially votable articles tonight is Article 1. Article 2, not Article 3 because of the disagreement we had about OPEM. Is that right? I don't know if you still have a disagreement. Yeah, I mean, can we talk about them? Sure. All right, Article 1. <coughs> Who Good. wants to talk about it? Good with Article 1. Done. I approve. It's fine. Support. Yep. Do we so want to vote it right now? Article 1. Does make, a make a motion to Thank accept you. Article 1 as written. Second. Second by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor? Aye. 4-0. Motion carries. We'll assign them later. Assign them later date. Yeah. Um, Article 2, fiscal year 2022 budget reconciliations. Was there anything controversial about that? But just so we understand, uh, Nancy, where are these, is this the account it's coming from? Like $584 from the roadway maintenance? It's going to roadway maintenance. So if you look at the All right, I'll take a different one. So the next one. So it's twelve thousand two hundred and forty dollars are going from the technical. What budget is it? It's going, those are the going issues. From where? So the widow's pocket, the technical services would come from widow's walk receipts, not retained earnings. They have the money. Okay. They're generating some receipts to cover that. The same with the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. They have the money from the widow's pocket receipts. Um, right now, I believe that they're going to generate enough receipts that we can take that from their receipts as well and not dip into their chain earnings. Um, the five and six, we both have to both have come to free cash because those are additional appropriations. And then seven. Um, Hold on. One, two, three, four. So twenty-seven thousand dollars from free cash for software. Yeah. And then sixteen thousand. 
15,000 is the deal of the century. The 5% town share match to get a truck and um, uh, radius. Okay. And then the number seven is property general liability insurance, and that one would come from another line. It would come from contributory health insurance because they're getting the premium holiday for the month of September. So we're saving uh, probably at least $150,000. So we will have the savings to apply to the uh, property general liability issue. And all that, that extra 100 grand is going to free cash anyway, so. Yeah, Do we know what the free cash number is? I have an estimate, but I have to pull my balance sheet back from the Department of Revenue because we are waiting for our clean water trucks loan reimbursement. So about my range is three point five to four point five. So good job. We had a, a lot of budget turnbacks. Revenue was still okay in some areas, um, better than we expected. So, but we have a lot of deficits out there. And that's huge free cash. Is that the biggest effort? No, I don't, I don't think Close. so. We, we had over, we had about three point five million years ago. Year. That was your low end, though. Yeah. I'm good with two. Anyone else have any questions? No. Nope. Somebody want to make a motion, please? Move to support Article Two as written. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. All in favor? Aye. 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 For nothing. Motion carries. So here's the transfer to reserves. And that was where the OPEP disagreement came in, correct? It was a question about the price, the way, whether or not we wanted to do this year what we did last year. It was it's not a policy, it was just what we did last year. What, so go over the first one. Widow's Walk, 100 grand. So my estimate for Widow's Walk is somewhere around, around $700,000. So they have enough to cover everything that's in this for them. So my recommendation is to put another $100,000 into their capital stabilization fund, which will bring it up to 215000 And we'll just continue to build that. And that's something that we can use towards the irrigation system and other products that are going to come forward. And they have stuff in Article 5 that would be funded from their uh, retained earnings as well. This would not completely exhaust their retained earnings. They would still have money that they can string. If things look good, you can still put more in capital stabilization or it could close out to their retained earnings for next year. Why would you put it there instead of just funding the current capital project? Why, why are you saving it for the, water, the irrigation instead of just paying the clubhouse? It's not necessarily for the irrigation. It's to build up some type of a reserve for that enterprise fund because that enterprise fund is the one that the has the most volatility due to the weather. And there have been years where we've had deficits. That, that, again, this goes back to the financial policies as to what is the, what do you want in these different capital stabilization funds? What do you want as a level of retained earnings? It's a bigger discussion. But to me, $115,000 for Widow's Walk when they've had deficits that have been more, more than, excuse me, more than that. And we'll see what happens I'd like to see them a lot, kind of at least two or three times that much in their um, reserve fund. And what's in their capital stabilization fund now? 115. Okay. Because it just really started up, right? But if they're having a weather concern, don't you want it in retained earnings as opposed to capital stabilization? How either, way, either way, it requires the town meeting vote to move it. Right, right but retained earnings can go to, f to fix the budget where capital stabilization isn't right, supposed but if, to. If you have two bad years in a row, Tony, you might not have any retained earnings. But why do you want it in a capital fund instead of a... Because it's there. It's, sa it's That's your savings bank as opposed to... It's like the town stabilization fund. We have free cash that rolls every year, but we put money in the stabilization fund. That's our rainy well, I day I know fund. how it works. So that's that's all this is, is putting a rainy day fund for the golf yeah, My question is why would you put it into retained earnings is the is the rainy day fund for operations. Capital stabilization is a rainy day fund for buying some piece of equipment later. I mean, retained earnings is more like your free cash. That's exactly what it is. Retained earnings is just a free cash excess on a year-to-year -year basis. 
So it fluctuates. That's why we want to put money into stabilization because that's there. We know that's there. Oh. But that's no, no, my, my question is stabilization has to go to a capital project. Retained earnings can go to operations. Stabilization can go to operations too if you want it to. You don't want to. It's not a good thing to do. Um, you don't want to use free cash towards operations either. You don't want to use either one. But you can. Is it a higher vote threshold to get it out of stabilization versus getting it out of Still retained, retained earnings? earnings. Two thirds versus a majority for retained earnings. Yeah. Two thirds versus what? Versus majority yeah. for retained earnings. Yeah. So it's and just again, it's it's harder. But if we're looking at that irrigation system coming down the road in however many years, that's going to be a big amount. I think it's a reasonable conversation to have with financial policy. We need to have two different reserves. So you don't end up with what they have, leasing stuff, leasing all of their equipment or not being able to replace their equipment. Um, and then you have something that is a backup for um, when you have an operational deficit. We're trying to do everything to lower the um, continue the current operational costs like pull, pull back and the equipment leases, keep down the debt so we don't have this major piece of fixed cost that we have to come up with and we have nowhere to go. What are you estimating the retained earnings will be after this year? After fiscal 22? I have What's that? After oh, no, after the, I'm sorry, fiscal 21. Uh, my estimate is 700000 In retained earnings? Yeah. Yeah. Because they made yeah. just five or 600 grand. Yeah, we had yeah. rollover from the prior year, and they had all that um, extra uh, uh, additional revenue, and they had um, budgetary turn backs. Like I said, these are just my estimates. Nothing has been served by yeah. revenue in the Yeah. That's my disclaimer. It's going to be like, I'm going to wear it as a necklace. This July was about 50 grand less than last year, though, right? I mean, there's so much in retained earnings. If we want to put a little there, I don't think it's a big deal. But, yeah. but just, just to, I don't want to belabor that conversation. Now, July golf revenues were probably about $50,000 less than last July. Because I mean, 4th of July was a washout this year. So it's, I would think August is going to be less also, just because July and August last year. We're yeah, we're not going to make seven hundred grand a year for. Yeah, no. If only. Um, we can wish. So, Keep what do playing. we want to do about this? Do we want to skip over this one? I'm fine with it. I'm fine with the okay. hundred. All right. What about the next? What about OPEB? OPEB situation. From last year, when we decided last year, we a one-off. We decided that the excess of meals tax revenue over the estimate. Room occupancy because it was the first year we had room occupancy receipts. We put those two items at the special town meeting into the OPEP stabilization fund. If we were to do it again for this special town meeting, that would be the number. We had uh, our meals tax estimate was low. We estimated 115,000 because we didn't expect there to be reasonably be that much. We took an over 200,000. Um, so there's a significant um, there. And the same with room occupancy, we haven't dedicated the room occupancy towards any liability more than we can get into the operational budget because we don't have a real feel for what that um, revenue source is going to do. Uh, so that if right now we close out like it did this year out to free cash and then be allocated elsewhere or um, we can dedicate it to something and that's something probably will, that will go through financial forecast. But I don't think for another year <coughs> we still don't know what that actual revenue source is going to bring in. So this is a way to put something <coughs> forward okay. Weren't expecting to take in additional meals tax revenue. The new occupancy tax isn't allocated to anything else. I think we were going to have healthy free cash. And I know the board don't have a policy other than the 2% for free cash. Um, and I know that they don't have a policy other than the 2% for funding OPEP. So again, it, it's a call of the board. So if we break down the component, how much do we put in OPEP anyways? 2%? Right now we do 2% of the 10%. That's how much is that? So we put it's on 100? top of that? Yeah. So that's in the budget. And then how much was it from meals tax, you said? 50 grand? No, the um, meals tax came in over 200,000. Um, but it's the excess, so. But we, we estimated 115. We cut so it down. So 85 grand there? Yeah, oh, we have more than that. Just, just over that. What's that? It's a little bit more than that. 100 grand? Yeah. And then the balance is room 
democracy. And you're putting all of the room in there, so that's not dedicated to anything right now. Right. So about sixty there. Oh, right, because the 278 doesn't include the 115. Right. So it's, so, wait, meals is, meals and room tax both equal 278? I guess it doesn't matter. Those are the only two components, right? Say that as I bring the spreadsheet. All right. Well, I, I didn't want you to keep looking. Okay. So um, meals was estimated at 115, came in at 257, so it's 142 on meals. Mm-hmm. And um, so 130. Had no, had no estimate and came in at 135. Hmm. Okay. So right now our policies say we have to put 2% of our reserve. We may put 2% of our Two percent of our pen pension uh, obligation. Pension, right. So we put in one fifteen, and you're suggesting we put in another three hundred, almost all of our room tax and a, and half of our meals tax, because we almost doubled it. Okay. So in the past, I, I guess my opinion is: there's is there something else we want to do with three hundred thousand dollars? then put it into this savings account or a portion of it. I would say yes. That there's something else you want to do with it? Well, I, I'll, I'll come up with something by the next meeting. Bandstand. Um, so this is not related to that advisory committee recommendation that they thought that we weren't being fiscally responsible. Is, is this the same discussion? I'm. It will be their same discussion with, with you yeah. about the OCAP liability trust fund. I just try to throw money at the OCAP liability. So, any opportunity they yeah, have, and at the fall special town meeting after pre cash has been certified. That's one of the opportunities to build up our reserves. And we did a lot of reserve building last year. Probably we hit seven or eight reserves, six or seven reserves. This year, I only brought four and three. But again, it's up to the board whether or not we want to leave those three um, and put additional funds in those reserves. And last year, we threw an additional $100,000 in, right? That's what we came yeah. up with a higher number and we said 100. Yeah. Thank you. It was the year-end transfers where we had the, okay. And we, and we reduced it. It was and like we 200 reduced it. And we, reduced we put 100. 100. Right. right. But the number was <coughs> faintly smaller. It was the same because we could see yeah. the freezing yeah. all All right. I was beginning to wonder what year I was in. So la last year there were three components that went into OPEB. Yeah. There was the 2%. There was extra money that you put in it. At, fall special and then there was the transfer money you put in. Yes. And I, I think we may disagree but I mean I this problem is so large and anytime we can take a chunk at it I, I think we have to I mean it's what we're still over 120 million of a major liability I mean the the albatross is not going away. And I know it's, well, you know, there, there's just a little bit, but it's, you know, other cities and towns have taken huge chunks and had to do it, take a big, um, you know, so I, I get that it's a small, but we can't keep kicking it down the, down the. Well, it's maybe the, small, but it's better than nothing, I suppose, right? Well, there's not a well, lot of towns that are doing it. There's a few towns few. that are, 
budget that have yeah, yeah. funded it. What, um, what? But also, I would say that Nancy and Jim, you know, with all the rating services that come in here, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, consistently suggest that we build up our OPEP to keep our interest rates down so that we're showing that we're being. We, we need to be more serious about OPEP if we want to increase our bond rating to. AAA. Right. So we've had that conversation a number of times, and we've come to the conclusion that that'll have no impact on it whatsoever. That it will not change our bond rating, right, Nancy? <laughs> we also would have to address our financial policies. Right. Um, I think what we do more at, at some point, not now, maybe not in the next two years, we might see our bond rating decrease if we haven't taken control of our own liability. Which we don't want that. Right. Well, that's. And if you look at the idea of the financial policies, what communities around us are doing basically the same communities that we look at for our water rate study, and we are um, lagging. So Novo puts all their meals tax into OPEB. I think Hanover puts 50% of their meal tax into OPEB. It just goes directly. When we did it in, in Norwell, it was actually illegal. And the Department of Revenue said you can't do that. We just said we're doing it anyways. I just want to make sure that we're, so we've had this conversation, and I, you know, I'm, so if we if we update well, let me, our let me just finish. Okay, so last the last two conversations we've had is this will have no impact on our bond rating. So I don't want to create a scenario that says, well, maybe in the future it will do this. You know, we've discussed this. There's many things. Our, our financial situations are very good. Our bond rating is very high, and OPEB is not going to get us to triple, you know, triple A or or A plus plus plus. Right, unless we, right, which we don't have the capability to Right, so I just want to make sure we all understand that we're not creating the scenario that's causing us to do this with an impact that it may not have. It's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's 300 grand. Um, it certainly would be going to a good place, but I think this is one of the rare opportunities that the board has control over funds that we can do something that that we think is important as opposed to throwing it into this bucket that is going to have minimal impact, whether it's whatever it happens to be. Can it go into a one-time expense, or is it more of a, a reoccurring? Could it go in, it's going to one time, right? Because it has to be supportive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be voted. No, no, I understand yeah. that, but I just, you know, when you say something that we want to do, we want to make sure that it's, we're we all the understanding do. that it's a, yeah. like, we don't want to add, we would love to add another, you know, body to a particular department, right? That's reoccurring, and you wouldn't suggest putting this money into some investment like that. So, so Tony's right, just taking what are small chunks of money when you look at what our liability is and tossing them into OPEB is not going to get the rating agencies to say, oh, you're serious about OPEP. Uh, you have to, so we're going to take the room occupancy tax. That's going to be dedicated to OPEP. This is going to be dedicated to OPEP. And then when we pay off our pension, that's going to be dedicated to OPEP. Then with everything else, they might say, okay, now you have a plan. It might be a lousy plan, but you have a plan to eventually pay off you all have liability. I mean, the only town that I know that's fully funded is um, Wellesley. Wellesley. Yeah. And they paid off their pension, they put that in, and then they did a million dollar override, and that money went into their, their OPEP. So they're the only ones that I know that are fully funded on their OPEP liability. But you have to put that other plan in place. Just saying, well, we get some extra money, we're going to throw it in this year, is not going to get the rating, rating agencies to say, oh, yeah, you, you're doing it. It's going to have to be more beyond that. that Kind of puts a plan in place. So right now our plan is we put two percent of our two percent pension Which, in there. Lots of other proposals for the plan, though. What's that? Lots of other proposals for the plan, though. Spoiler alert for the financial policy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the plan has been, when the pension gets paid off, that there'll be seven million dollars a year that's going to go in there. <coughs> you know that that's unfortunately the pension date keeps getting pushed off years and right. years and years. So. Right. But that's not that's not in our policy. That needs to be put in right. Our that's that's been our guide. But that's the big chunk of money that you see in the future. Right. Twenty twenty eight, twenty nine. What's the pension? I think it's twenty thirty one now. So they might have moved it again. Um, so I'll tell you what. I I would suggest that we 
wait for Karen to get back and have a full discussion on that article. Um, and it, again, I just want to make sure we're all fully understanding what it is and whatever we do with it, we do with it. Well, and I, and I would recommend that when we come back to that discussion that we have some ideas of where you want to spend that $100,000 right. or whatever that amount is. Two hundred and seven, whatever it is. Whatever that amount is. Or a portion of it. Yep. You may just say, right, we want I, to build a statue of John Danny is. and <laughs> put the rest in open. Well, um, maybe at your next meeting we will have certified free cash and retained earnings and have a number, concrete number, and mm -hmm. the capital plan is out to the pharmacist. Okay. All right, so we're going to skip that. Moving on to Article 7, the local options acceptance. Well, what about the SPED reserve? Oh, well, I thought we were just going to... I know, but we should maybe have... So this is this is what we said we would do, or is this year two of this? The last year we authorized the, 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 um, the creation of this reserve fund and said we would fund it at a later time. This reserve fund is not a stabilization fund. It has a limit on it, it cannot be more than 2% of net school spending, so it's got a limitation of just under $900,000 that it can ever have as a balance. And money isn't taken out of town meeting, it's taken out by a, a vote of the town, the select board, and school committee. So it's, neither one can access the funds without the other as a But when we created this account, so this has been a, a school expense for the last mm -hmm. 375 years, and now we said create the SPED fund, and we said we would give it some seed money, but not necessarily regularly putting money from the town budget into there. So this is the seed money that we talked about. Correct. Okay. So we did talk about that, and that's yeah. what we said we'd do. You good? I'm we good. We did talk about it at some point. A lot. So I think we're skipping this article. Okay. We're skipping right. Article 4? No, article. Yes. Yes, I'm skipping article, article three. Three. Oh, now, yes. We're on to article seven, the local option acceptance. Oh. That doesn't seem to be. Why aren't we talking about article four? I'm sorry, I'm not following. Capital planning needs to opine on that first. And they have to opine on the uh, school first. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're trying to get rid of the easy ones first. Oh, but so that wasn't the one. Succeeding. To okay. Get rid of the easy ones first. Okay. Sorry. It's all right. So the next quote unquote easier one is a local option acceptance deferral of water usage fees. Um, and I think that's for elderly people. Yeah. You can defer your taxes under 41 This is kind of like a nice veterans time. type of a. Someone most actually wanted to do it this year, and um, Joe called me and asked me if, I, you know, if we'd accept the local statute. So so and when you say Joe, you mean the assessor? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'll make a motion to approve. Supporting Article 7 as written. Second. Second by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries for nothing. And I'll Article make a motion to eight. approve Article 8 as Thank written. You. Second. Second by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor? Aye. 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 For nothing. You're a little lagging over there. <laughs> for nothing, motion carries. Um, endorsement of master plan as recommended and approved by the planning board. Anyone want to discuss that? Um, we all did receive copies of it, many drafts, many opportunities to have input. It's, I believe, been finalized. Is it the master plan has been accepted by the state, finalized, or do we have to accept it first and then they... We accept it first. We accept it first. Okay. Does anyone have a problem with us voting on that? No. Board. All right. May I have a motion, please? Move to the select board vote to recommend Article 9, endorsement of master plan as recommended and approved by the planning board. Moved by Mr. Goodrich, second by? Second. Second by Mr. Bagnani. All in favor? Yes. yes. Aye. 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 Or nothing, motion carries. <laughs> Beat me to the punch <laughs> that time. All right. So, um, so we will take up the other articles because there are other boards involved. Are 10 and 11 coming in? Or they're the same person, right? Yeah, they're going to planning board on the 9th. Um, you can certainly invite them to one of your kitchen meetings that we 
I, I think there are people actually here for that because I can't oh. why else they would be here at this time. Okay. What do so, we want to hear from first? The planning board? The planning board. Sorry, it's just hard to hear. Well, if they're yeah. sitting here, maybe they want to give us a quick overview? Sure. Are you the petitioner? I, did, was I, the, I saw something written by Mr. Bowen. Yes. Explaining. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bowen can't be here this evening, but he did write these petitions, and yes. he is confident that they are legally They pass most That's of Rich Bowen? Yeah. Yes. He's hoping I'd be able to make it on Thursday. I think it's I think it's somewhere in the backup. The mm -hmm. analysis of the articles. We got an email. Yeah. yeah. We got an email. You're right. Send it okay. out. Yeah. Yeah. I know I read something by Rich mm -hmm. Bowling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he sent it to Karen Joseph and Karen shared it with us and I shared That's, it with the board. That was the trail. Yes. Right. Thank you. Would you like to yes. uh, say who you are? Very gladly so. Uh, I'm Keith Saunders. I um I was raised in Sichuan since 1970. Uh, 1986 graduate of SHS. I have a PhD in sociology from Northeastern University. My area of concentration was drug policy and social movements. And this was back in the late 1990s and early 2000s as we were seeing medicinal marijuana start to emerge. I identified it as something that seemed to be a trend that we were going to be on. That is, people were questioning prohibition, uh, seeing that the long-term effects of it were not producing what we had been promised. In fact, in many ways, it produced the opposite of it and questioning the reasons that we were having it, which is explaining why we've seen this movement um, in the United States, in Massachusetts, over the past 20 years. Uh, I worked, um, after finishing my dissertation, I worked with the Massachusetts Cannabis Reform Coalition. I was on the board for 10 years. I was president for five years. I have served on the board of directors for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws since 2010. Um, this is my vocation, this is my calling, right, is, is drug policy and social movement and looking at how we relate to the substances that are in the world around us. And cannabis obviously is something that's quite interesting because it's an organic substance, it's natural, we used it for thousands and thousands of years and then we hit this point in the early, two, nine, uh, early 2000s or 1900s where it became a target for identifying racial minorities, targeting them, criminalizing them. And this spread out um, until we hit the 1960s when the marijuana user as defined by the prohibitionists became white, middle class, college educated, Barack Obama, et cetera. And uh, you know, Clarence Thomas, I mean, it's, it, it, across the spectrum, it becomes ubiquitous. And so as this generationally unfolds, we now have to confront the problem that we had with criminal prohibition. And how are we gonna control cannabis use without using law enforcement in the way that we had because that just simply wasn't working. When, when we first prohibited cannabis criminally, there were tens of thousands of users in the United States. There are tens of millions of users today and all of those people started using under prohibition. So clearly the criminal justice approach doesn't work. Now, I don't have any investment in any particular cannabis company. I've worked independently. I've advised people who have opened up dispensaries in Massachusetts, recreational stores in Massachusetts. Um, I've, I, I opened the first cannabis vocational school east of San Francisco in Natick, Massachusetts, uh, the Northeastern Institute for Cannabis. Uh, I was the education director for a year there. Um, and I learned quite a bit about what we're dealing with here in the process. Um, when we legalized it, and I've been participating in the decriminalization, the medical and the legalization campaigns as they were happening, um, when we legalized it, we changed the entire scene. So all of that which prohibition had relied upon now can fall into question. And we've had almost a decade of cannabis sales in Colorado, and we know what happens when you open up a cannabis store, nothing in particular. And same thing happened in Massachusetts. When you opened up a, a cure leaf in Hanover, did anybody, did anything happen? No, we, we don't see anything. Why? Because the cannabis market was so well established under prohibition that when we legalized it, nothing really changed. Now, does anybody want to venture a guess? I'm not going to ask you to go on record because I know that we're being filmed. Just venture a guess in your head. How many pounds of marijuana do situate residents over the age of 21 use in a year? Or sorry, in a month. How many pounds? 
how many pounds of marijuana do situate residents over the age of 21 who could legally purchase it in stores use every month? Is it five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds? No idea. All right. I did some math. How do you track that data? I'm going to show you. <laughs> I'm a sociologist. And I'll explain my methodology as well. Thanks. All right. First, we take the demographics. This is from the U.S. Census. Total population, population over 18. I calculated the population over 21 by estimating that Situate has 300 graduates or dropouts and 50 graduating from other schools in any given year. Now, the actual number is closer to 200. So I overestimated the number of people who are under 21. So underestimated the number of people over. According to the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, and this data comes from the Cannabis Control Commission's website, 21.1% of residents over 18 use marijuana within the past 30 days. Applying the mean, we have X number. Where do I have that? I think I have two different copies here. Yes. Applying 67%. Do you have the 67% of the mean? Yeah. Or, yeah. Applying 67% of the means to the Situates 21 population gives us 1,920 monthly users. 14% of Massachusetts residents over 18 use marijuana daily. Okay, I'll get to this one. Because <laughs> I readjusted down to 67 because generalization effects saying, hey, that's the means for the whole state. Let's underestimate for Situate. Underestimating, if 14% use marijuana daily, applying 67% of the mean means 646 people in Situate, Massachusetts over 21 use marijuana every day. The volume, assuming that a regular daily user uses one gram, which is the weight of a cigarette, tobacco cigarette, it's not a huge amount. Patients use quite a bit more than that. One gram for daily users, four grams or one gram a week for monthly users, we consume 53.8 pounds of marijuana flour every month. How much does that cost? Well, it's currently selling for $279 a month in Rockland's two dispensaries on average. They're 453.6 grams in a pound, or $4,536 in gross revenue, and that's at the largest scale, so you pay less per gram. Grams are typically selling for $14 to $18 right now. The cost of licensed retail cannabis sold by the ounce to supply situates 21 and older residents demand is $244,236 a month. 3% local tax can draw $87,935 with these underestimates, not counting people from Cohasset or Norwell or Marshfield or Hanover or Hull or any of the tourists or any of our seasonal residents. Norwell is expected to get over $300,000 in two years, and Rockland is expected to get over $200,000. Now, what's important here is that the moratorium that was voted by the voters doesn't prevent anything with regard to growing it, I'm growing it, using it, I use it, possessing it, buying it, sharing it, turning it into food and concentrates, and then consuming it. None of that's illegal. You know what's illegal? Collecting a tax. That's it. It's the only thing that's illegal. Now, some, pe some people have said, hey, with the tax, you know, it's not really that much, whatever it happens to be. But with delivery, which is coming soon, it means that every doorstep in Situate becomes a potential local taxation for Norwell, for Marshfield, for Quincy, for Rockland, but not for Situate, because we can't collect the tax. So I'm asking that the board vote in support of this article. Any questions? Yes. Ms. Curran? Don't we still have an issue with banking and financing? Not really. <laughs> what? We don't. 
Massachusetts they might. doesn't. Yeah. I know, but mm-hmm. how? But so where there, do you, there are banks that I don't want to, but there are banks that will do business. Oh, with them. the entire marijuana industry in Massachusetts is through banking. It's done. It's all done in cash. But it's done in Massachusetts Bank. Century Bank has about 25 different accounts, and they're based out of Medford. Yeah, doing it. So would it so come to the done. town in cash? Yes, it has to be in cash. You can't you can't pay the tax any other way. So can we take? I mean, you're you're clearly educated in this. You're mm-hmm. clearly extreme one one side of this. Mm-hmm. What do you want to do in in Article 10? What we want to do is we want to lift the moratorium, the ban on taxable, regulatable cannabis. You want to business. lift the moratorium in allowing somebody to build a dispensary in situ. Yes, to operate a dispensary. That's you don't necessarily have to build 11. it. A right, lot so, of, Article 11 yeah. makes the zoning changes necessary to allow a, disp- a non-medical dispensary mm-hmm. in situ. So let's, what's 10? 10. 10 is Let him say it's his article. Ten is, ten is to lift the moratorium, to end the ban on operating licensed, regulated cannabis businesses in situ. And you want to do, is that right? No, 11 is the zoning article. 10 is to have a special act of the legislature allowing up to three dispensaries yes. in situ. And you say the legislature meaning town meeting? Oh. It's no, Tom Meany would ask state. the state legislature state, to state. pass a special it's, act. It's up to three cannabis businesses, so not just not just dispensaries. There, so we can have a cultivation site like we have Untold Brewing, which well, is. I, I'm confused why he's telling me what's going on here and you're not. He has them in different order, so yeah. No, but he's not. I mean, the zoning. It right. tends to special act. So ten is you want to go to the state and you want to say, hey, state. Allow three dispensaries in my in the town three of Citrus. Three licensed cannabis businesses. There are multiple tiers of cannabis business. There are there are recreation stores, there are medical dispensaries, there are delivery services, there are cooperatives, there are manufacturing sites, and there are laboratories. So we already allow medical. You have to, yes. Right. So that's not one of your if someone that, wants to put a medical one in, they can do it now. If someone wants to put in a medical And most place, of those other things it. that you just mentioned sell it also. No. The testing labs only test right, it. Testing labs, Manufacturing right. labs only take in cannabinols from a source outside and turn them into food and But other don't products. they usually have a retail component? Nope. The one no, in Milford You're does. allowed to have three licenses in Massachusetts. Any holder is allowed well, to have I, three. Okay, well, that's a technical. So you can have a growth space, you can have a dispensary, you can have a manufacturing plant, but you can't have a testing site. Or you can have a testing site. I understand, I understand. But so, and the reason you want to do this is so that the town can get eighty-seven thousand dollars in taxes. It's starting approximately. Out yeah, yeah. Well, that's your whole sole purpose of this is for the town to get eighty-seven thousand dollars, so Nancy can put in an OPEP. Yes. Well, I mean, I knew that was coming. Uh, I was just to saying. give you a little bit more of my background, <laughs> I, I live on Itchy's Corner in the West End. Itchy was my grandfather. My mother worked for Dave Daphne and Dr. Joseph, small businesses here in Situate. I, it's small business in situate. I like the idea of the two of them together, and this is exactly what that would fall into. Situate needs. So you are doing need. it for economic development, for for common just, sense. That we're going to lose a whole bunch of money. That eighty-seven thousand dollars we're not collecting is going someplace else. So you want to do it for eighty-seven thousand dollars? That's what you want to. I want to do it because it's the right thing to do. Because small business is good for the community. It creates jobs. It creates business taxes. It, it taxes. It can generate traffic to North Citrus because these are destination businesses. It can do a whole bunch of things to the benefit of the town. So that's what I'm trying to get at. Why you're doing this? So you want economic development for small businesses, and you want to create eighty-seven thousand dollars in taxes to go to the. I'm town. saying that eighty-seven thousand dollars is an estimate of how many ta- how much in taxes could be coming in if or hundred thousand or fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah, I estimated low. I said we're using sixty-seven percent of what the state uses on its averages. No, I, and, I get it. Yeah. Math, you can get whatever number you want, um, but. That's what I'm trying to understand. What what your purpose? So if the town, and again, I'm I'm just taking uh-huh. the other other opinion. These guys may have a different. So if the town doesn't want it, if the citizens don't want it, then it's no different than it is right now. Right, and what they should be weighing against that is starting three new businesses potentially, uh-huh. and gaining somewhere under a hundred thousand dollars in tax revenue, and not losing that. 
because the people, when they order it and they pay for it at their door, that means the money goes to Rockland. It never comes to Sidgwick. Right. Well, that's generating. It. But that's yeah, so so yeah, people will not be net exporting tax dollars. Right. So that that's what as we when we explain this to the town, mm -hmm. we should say here are the two options. Mm -hmm. One, we want to have three three small businesses and generate ninety thousand dollars of revenue, Up or not have. That you, I don't know how many businesses Citroen could actually support. It should, probably can't support three retailers. I doubt that. One retailer, yes. I know this from, from research that I paid for back in 2015. We can do one retailer. They said Scarsaloni's gas station was the ideal location. Can't do it there. Greenbush Medical Building, second best location. Now I understand it's going to be condos. Can't do it there. North Sichuan Greenbush, somewhere in a commercial district. It's no different than a CVS. CVS sells opiates. I mean, this is cannabis. Kids can't walk in there. I go to Untold Brewing. And you got kids, you got pets, parents are drinking, everything's fine. And I'm not even asking about a social consumption site because that's not going to work in this town either. Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, I just want cl clarity on the three um, licenses. Is it mm -hmm. that a license holder can operate up to three facets of the business? So you potentially could have nine different Okay, no, you so don't it's have only three, three establishments. establishments. We, could have, we could have three licenses held by one entity, or three licenses held by three entities, or two and one. But and it no all more applies than three. to one of those different facets. That's my question. Okay. No, it would apply to okay. any, any one of no, them. I, I know. So you could have three growers. Yes. In fact, a, co -op, a cooperative right. would do very well in Situate. Yeah. It's, it's got a low footprint. Um, if they did it outdoors and they use greenhouses and light deprivation, they'd be able to get reliable crops. This summer has been hell on <laughs> people who are growing outdoors. It's been incredibly wet. Um, so it makes it difficult. Andrew, that was my question. Any questions? Two, two questions. So most of the, the growing is done indoors. Right now, most of the growing in Massachusetts is done indoors. When you talk about places like Oregon and California, Northern California, it's almost entirely outdoors. Yes. Security and other stuff. Absolutely. Do you have any data on, so if there's a retail store, how many people, how many people do they normally hire? Because you have the, you know, you're, most of them hire four or five people, and then some of the other manufacturers, I mean, yes, it's one new business, but it could be... 10, 12, 13 new jobs. Do you have any of that data or? Off the top of my head, I'll tell you that the typical retail business is going to open up with about 18 to 20 people from top to bottom, from their CEO, CFO, to their treasurer, to their you know, legal advisor, to the managers, to the bud tenders, to you know, the promotions people in advertising. To, and follow up, so how about data on property value? Property value doesn't decrease. It, it, it pretty much goes up. Um, there has been, no, in Colorado, there's been no tie to increases in crime. In fact, the, the, if you open up a dispensary, crime tends to decrease in the street. Um, one of the things that Prohibition relied upon was this thing that, you know, we're going to go and we're going to say it's always been this way, it's always been illegal, and if we legalize it now, all of these bad things will happen. And then we legalized it, and we're not seeing it. The, the police and the EMTs aren't reporting that when they pry open the door with the jaws of life, a bong is rolling out of the car, but they still see the Jack Daniels bottles. So we're not seeing any difference in large part because we've always had such large consumption in our lifetimes. More? Another question, sorry. Yes. Who is the licensing authority in this instance? Is it us, the town? Um, okay. It's, it's a two-part process. The town has to approve the business and what's called a host community agreement, which allows for the, the charging of up to 3% of gross revenues for up to five years for attributable expenses incurred by the town. That is on top of the 3% municipal tax. So typically, uh, it's about $200,000, $250,000 over three years that the town ends up getting on top of the 3%. You are the licensing authority. Yeah, that's what a slide. Okay. So I'm gonna double check if it came down from the and state. And you signed the host agreement. Yeah, and then the and then the and then the cannabis community uh, cannabis control commission has the authority to issue the license or not. Do they issue the licenses based on population? 
No, they issue the licenses based upon applicant, um, you know, competency. Basically, do they have what the CCC Financial is looking plan. for? You have to have plans to help rectify uh, problems caused by criminal prohibition. So it's the social equity program and an economic empowerment program, um, which in a town like Situate, it's not because we've had disproportionate enforcement, but we do have a number of people in this town who have past convictions, and those people who qualify for social equity. And so I guess the question I'm really asking is, how do they decide how many licenses a particular town gets? The town does. The town, so we could, we could say we want to give out 21 licenses. So you only get three. It, you need to get approval from the state, but uh, yeah. Well, that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> yes. Who, who says, well, we would, you can have We 10. would be capped by the legislation that he wants to You're pass right. that would cap us at three. Yes. Now, and just I for the board, something. I don't think... He's aware of this. I had a conversation with Karen Joseph at about 6.15 tonight. There is some disagreement between Attorney Bowen and Attorney Amara whether that legislation is necessary or not. We don't have an answer to that yet, but they, are, they have some disagreement as to whether or not that is necessary. So the, let's just pick on Norwell. The town of Norwell had to go to, or is it Hanover where Cure Relief is? Hanover is where Cure Relief is. All right. The town of Hanover had to go to the state legislator, le legislature and get what? So they just allowed it. <laughs> they what? They, they allowed it. So yeah, the it, it from it a moratorium. Cure relief well, is a medical dispensary only, so it doesn't count. Let's talk Canavan and Rockland. All right, let's talk. Can Rockland had to, after they, Rockland never banned. Rockland never put a moratorium. So as soon as it was legal to apply, people were going into Rockland and saying, I want to open up a cannabis business and talking to the local planners and so forth, where they were going to locate it, how large it was going to be, what they expect in traffic and that entire thing. And um, so they launched it right away. So that's why they're open. There's going to be a third one open in Rockland and the Marshfield just opened up as well. So it's going to be two in Marshfield, I think. Yep. One's open and just one's open. Yep. Last on week. 139, I think I yep. thought I saw it. Yep right up near the Pembroke line. I drove so, by it the other day. So no one is stopping anyone from having a marijuana retail operation on every street corner? Nobody's yes. stopping that? Yeah, no, it, it's one out of five. If you have, if for every five alcohol liquor licenses you issue, you have that's what no I'm, more than that's one, yes. That's the question I'm and asking. And we have, we have, I think, 16. I'm inarticulately, but that's yeah, the question I think I'm we asking. have 16 permanent alcohol licenses um, so in the town. So it is based on a be three. formula. Yeah, and it, okay. it's my understanding that the way this article is written, the dispensaries or the commercial, I'll call them commercial operations, would have the same prohibitions that the medical dispensaries would have within 500 feet of a daycare or a park or, so that's the reason the Jeffrey Medical Building, there's a daycare across the streets within 500 feet. So even if it wasn't gonna be condos, wouldn't qualify. Well, yeah, but you can get an abeyance. It, the, the, town, the town can actually say we would allow 479 feet rather than 500, like Jamie's Pub's location, where that would be an ideal location for a cannabis store, but it's 490 feet from the park. Well, property line to property line. Okay. Okay. But so, those, those would still be in existence. All right. So I'm, I'm just wondering what the other side would say. So if we the other side says, what well, about the say, children? Let me finish my question. <laughs> so if I, if I called Amory Galvin right now uh -huh. and had her come down here, she'd say if we put one in situate, it'd be easier to access to situate kids. Nope, it won't be. It will be. No, you can't get it's inside. It's closer. So it's, look, the first time I saw weed, I was in the gate school, the old gate school. I went through high oh. school. I never used it, but I saw it all the time. And this was during not, the Just Say No I'm not saying it era. doesn't exist, but it, it's closer. It's e it would be easier for someone to get. It's not. Okay. <laughs> and she would say it's a gateway drug. That's also not true, and we have evidence to support that that's not true. I guarantee you she could there find is, me a piece of paper sure, that said exactly a, the opposite of what you're there's saying. There's a general progression of drug use in American culture. The first drug we use typically is caffeine. We give children caffeine throughout their lifetime. This I is don't, I, I'm just telling you this is what the other side is going to say. I know, gonna, so I've been working so this So everyone has years. to make their own decision on where they stand on sure. on cannabis and the usage of it and the Absolutely. impact on, on society. Yeah. Um, I guess my, the only other thing I was thinking is you said, well, you said crime's going to go down and property values are going to go up, mm -hmm. which I find 
hard to believe. It but goes against your prohibition stories, but prohibition no longer exists. So that's why we're seeing the things that so supported prohibition fall apart. We can make more than this and hire more people if we built a Chick-fil-A in situ. No, you wouldn't. Chick-fil-A requires meals traffic. Meals tax would go through the roof. It, it, Chick-fil-A requires too much traffic. They would never open up a franchise. No, they wouldn't. I'm saying Just like the 99 never would. Right. I guess my point is there's more of a reason for you to do this than just the economic development in the town. This is my life's work. Right. Is to liberate and, and work towards, I, I fight ignorance and disease. And prohibition relies on both. And this idea that, that prohibition is gonna reduce the number of kids who have access to marijuana has proven to be false for 70 years. That it's gonna lead people to use other drugs. 67% of Americans have used marijuana in their lifetime and we're talking about 14% of them using every day and 21% of them using in the past 30 days. Which means most people stop using. It doesn't lead to the use of other oh, substances, sure. despite the fact that there is a general progression of drug use from alcohol to nicotine to, uh, sorry, from caffeine to nicotine to alcohol to marijuana. Do, do dispensaries now, in, do they have a police presence at all times? Some do, some don't. Um, and the police presence, uh, it, for example, in Northampton, they got rid of it. Um, the, the police presence is not there to prevent crime. The police presence is there to prevent people from selling to people who might be in line. Uh, Northampton has pretty, or not Northampton, um, um, Great Barrington has also removed all police presence. And, did, and, who, and so the, the dispensary would, would pay that detail? The dispensary pays the detail that goes through the, um, the host community agreement if the town wants somebody there. Now, There's no more reason to have a police presence outside of it than to have it outside of a bank. I mean, if you expect that the bank's going to get robbed, yeah, but you know, dispensaries are more secure than banks. You can't get into them without showing your identification. You're not allowed inside. And then there's a man trap that as you walk into the dispensary, you're literally locked in a box. You can't go one way or another unless they let you in. You have to provide your ID before they let you in. You go in, you meet somebody, they guide you through the process of what they have available and what you might want, why you might want it, and whatever, how much you might want to purchase. There is no product on display. That is, you can't touch any of it as it's a customer. It's like the Apple store. Very many ways. If you want anything, you tell them what they want, and they either have a fulfillment person come from the back room and bring it out to the register, or they themselves go in the back room and bring it out to the register. You go to the register, and before you can buy it, you got to show your ID again. You get carded twice. Nobody under 21 is allowed in these stores. Nobody. And you can't, it's not going to happen. It's not like a liquor store where the kid can walk in the liquor store and pull a bottle off the shelf, crack it open, and take a swig. It just, that doesn't happen. It's, it's not possible. And every inch of the place is on camera. And yes, there have been troubles with people having been robbed because they have to have cash. We're getting past that. Once, once the federal law, which has been proposed by Cory Booker and endorsed by a variety of senators and representatives, um, will establish national banking for cannabis so that we'll be able to have credit card purchases and, and stuff like that to reduce the cash flow. So that also reduces the risk of, of robbery. Um, and then every cannabis business right now has two safes. One is for their cannabis supply and one is for the cash. And the, the tr armored trucks come by just about every day because they do five to six figures. You know? um, Canna provisions in Lee, they're right off the Mass Pike. During their peak regularly does one hundred and twenty dollars to $130,000 in sales per day. And it's, it, it's just because the price is high, because they are in an extremely high traffic area, um, Situate won't do that type of volume. No, should we want to do that type of volume? I think, you know, something like our local liquor stores. They're not huge, right? Um, there's, a, there's a can of provisions in East Hampton. It's literally like a bodega. It's, you walk in, there's, there's a counter, there's a cash register, the cameras and so forth, but it's like two people at a time. That's it. You know, it doesn't generate a, a tremendous amount of traffic. Um, when it first opened, when they first opened, traffic was huge, but that hasn't been a problem. I mean, you can go to Rockland, right near the Home Depot, you can drive, there's two of them right there. 
and go take a look. You'll see parking lots that have three or four cars in them. Right. I mean, I would suggest the board, my, I, I went to one of, one of the ones in Rockland, even before this came up, I wanted to see. First time you go in there, I'm like, why am I not being arrested? This pot everywhere. It's kind of a surreal, yeah. uh, a surreal feeling. But um, they're, they're quite the operations. If you get a chance, pop into one. Well, I think it'll be an interesting debate. I think yeah, it, I, agree. I think the town will have to decide what they want to do. Mm -hmm. I just think I don't I don't think we're doing it for economic development, and I don't think we're doing it for 87 grand. I think you're doing it because. You're a huge proponent of the industry, and you just want to spread it. Well, I, into I'm the, not a into proponent of the industry. I'm, I'm an, you said you, were the, you just said this is your life. My life is advocating for the end of prohibition. Yes, and right. prohibition well, you on just a business. Said you were consultant for here. You ran here. This is your life. This is your. This I, is your profession. I taught for 20 years, and then I entered the cannabis industry right. as it emerged. I, I, I so I guess it'll be interesting to see because there's going to be people on the other side I understand. that are going to bring up the whole other side of it and yep. we'll see what the town wants to do. But yeah, this, this will probably all be re-argued on Thursday. Oh. I know uh, Anne Marie's probably going to be at the planning board on Thursday. Um, um, the difference, I think, between me and Anne Marie, she gets paid. She actually gets a grant for the work that she does to tell people not to use drugs and I don't to tell people that we should change the laws. That, my, my work to change the laws. That's not well fair to Anne Marie yeah. to say she doesn't because she gets yes. paid. Well, well, you get paid she, too if, from if you want to stick to your LLC, argument. Sorry. Well, no, that was my I business that closed think, in 2016. I don't think we need to go down any, to I'm, any I'm personal. sorry, if he wants to stick to his argument, he can stick to his argument, Correct. but he doesn't have to disparage exactly. town employees I, and I question agree. their motives because no one's questioning his. Well. Well, I was asked I why I'm doing this. Actually, someone was questioning. Yes, yourself. I was. You were asked why um, you're doing, but you didn't have to motive. take a gratuitous I, shot at a town employee. I was but, asked but, what my motives were. Excuse me. It was wrong for you to mention Anne Marie Galvin. I didn't I bring her up. That. I was I, I, brought up to me. We're not going down that road any further. All right. Sure. We're not. So I think we're done with this discussion for tonight. Good. Unless anyone on the board had any specific questions that haven't been nope. answered. I'm clear. And it will be clearly a spirited discussion at town meeting, no doubt. No doubt. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you all for listening. I appreciate the thank time you that you gave me. In. And for, thank you. you know, asking yeah, Thanks for explaining. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Discuss about Drain Layer's new license for John Riccio, Jr. Does anyone have the motion? I'm looking. Move to approve a drain layers license for John Riccio, Jr. Moved by Mr. Vignani. Second. Second by Mr. Goodrich. I'm looking. We're on to the one day. So we just had a motion by Mr. Vignani to approve the drain layers license for John Riccio. It was seconded by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Motion carries. We have a list of uh, one day malt and wine licenses. Someone could make a motion, please. Move to approve a one day wine and malt license to Ellen McKenzie for an event located at the Lucky Finn, uh, 206 Front Street on September 11th, 2021 from 6.30 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move motion to, carries 4-0, sorry. Move to approve a one-day wine and malt listen, license to Family Crest for an event located at Citrus Maritime Center, 119 Everett Farshall Road on September 11th, 2021 from 5.30 p.m. until 9.30 p.m. Moved by Mr. Vagnani, second by? Second. second. Ms. Curran, all in favor? Aye. 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 Four nothing, motion carries. Move to approve a one-day wine and malt license to Ellen McKenzie for an event located at Situate Maritime Center, 119 Edward Foster Road on September 12th, 2021 from 5 p.m. until 9 p.m. Motion by Mr. Vagnani. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. And lastly, move to approve a one-day wine and malt license to Simply Serving for an event located at Citrus Maritime Center at 119 Edward Foster Road on September 19th, 2021 from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. Motion by Mr. Vagnani. Second by... Second. Second. Mr. Goodrich, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Discuss vote, board and committee appointments and renewals. 
want to make a motion to nominate, appoint someone who is here tonight to the Historic Commission as a full member? Do we want to take a, a meeting to think about it? The, could. I mean, there were two. There were, there were two. And there were two for the other position as well, for for um, waterways? Or do well, we not want really. For waterways, there's one asso current associate to be promoted to full-time and then it's up to us if we want to assign the balance of the three who came forward today as all associates so we could appoint three associates tonight if we wanted to yeah. so we could appoint the current associate David Haley as a full member and then appoint the other three who are here tonight as associate members <coughs> right yep yeah we could do lots of stuff so does anyone want to make a motion? Well, on the Historical Commission, Lorraine, we did find out Mr. Glinsky, I think he said he would be willing to be an associate, but I don't think we asked the same question of Mr. Whitaker. And since Mr. Whitaker is also still on the capital planning, I mean. I think. I don't, I don't think you asked Mr. Glinsky. I thought, I thought we did. I thought we said to him. That was for waterways. That's for waterways, yeah. all right. Well, then perhaps we should just, unless someone feels strongly about one, one candidate or the other. I don't, I mean, I don't know that we have to wait another, another meeting. They're both great candidates and I think they'll both be an asset and there are folks that want to step off that committee right. again in a couple of a year or two, so. I, don't, I think it's a win-win, honestly. Yeah. That's just my so would someone like to make a motion for the full member? Um, sure, I'd like to move um, James Glinski to appoint to the Historic Commission as a full member for a term of three years or until a successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by Ms. Curran, second by second. Mr. Vignani. All in favor? Aye. Four to zero, motion carries. And I'll move to appoint Jack Whitaker to the Historic Commission as an associate member for a term of three years or until a successor is named in completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by Ms. Curran, second. second by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries four to zero. All right, now we're down to waterways. Is that the one we want to do, or? Yeah, you, you yeah. the full member and then appoint the other three as associate members? I'll okay. move to appoint David Haley as a full member to the Waterways Commission for a term of three years or until a successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest law and online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by Ms. Curran, second? Second. Second by Mr. Bagnani, all in favor? Aye. 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 For nothing, motion carries. And I'd like to make a motion to appoint David Deneen, T.J. Mulvesti, and Brian Cronin, all as associate members to the Waterways Commission for a term of three years or until a successor is named and completion of the Conflict of Interest Law Online Training Program is completed within three, 30 Second. days. Second. 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 You're Second. here. Mr. Kudrich, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Motion, car motion carries 4 zero. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think, you know, it's great lucky. because these associate positions give, fo give folks an, a, a glimpse. Yep, a yeah, path. A path. Yeah. And they can step off or keep going. Yep. So now we're, we have a bunch of reappointments. Yeah, the right? reason why we don't have um, everybody in the position of the appointment is that it's other people that need to be able to stay there and stay there. And that was the postal advisory board. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Move to reappoint George Humphrey, Tracy Kelly, Michelle McGrath, and Janice Murphy to the Citrus Cultural Council for a term of three years, or until a successor is named. The completion of the conflict interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. 
Second. Second by Ms. Warren. All in favor? Aye. 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 Four number motion carries. Going to 11. Yep. There it is. A move to uh, reappoint Joanne. Wickoff to Water Resources Commission for a term of three years until successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest online training program is completed within 30 days. Motion by Mr. Goodrich. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. All in favor? Aye. 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 For nothing, motion carries. Move to reappoint Howie Kurtzberg, Craig Rosenquist, and David Sinkowski um, to the Waterways Commission for a term of three years or until a successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Second by? Second. Mr. Goodrich. Beat you to it. All mm -hmm. in favor? Aye. 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 Four nothing motion carries. And I'll move to reappoint Steve Gard as an associate member to the Waterways Commission for a term of three years or until a successor is named in completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Motion by Ms. Curran. All in favor? A second? Second. Second by Mr. Bagnani. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, thank you. We're making headway, right? Yeah. Yep. Onward and upward. So, on to liaison reports. Does anyone have people? I'll just note that um, on CPCT, we've got a meeting on Monday where they're going to talk about a couple of those issues. One is going to be the um, baseball field, and the other one is going to be the border street. So I'm sure Andrew A and I, or one of us, will be there. Um, and the other one is uh, Rec uh, Commission sent a letter out today that they supported the uh, baseball field being put at the old gate school oh. Oh, that's in the good. field back there. So that, and that was the Recreation Commission. Rec Commission. Thank you. Huh. Somewhat surprised about that. Andrew, liaison, liaising with anyone lately? Yeah, no, there was the historic event. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'll, we'll fill in more after the next meeting. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'm good, nope. Yeah. I didn't have any well, meetings this past Day week. Weekend. It's like a week. Yeah. Sort of big vacation yeah. week last week. So I don't have anything either other than hopefully within a week or a half or so we will be done with the school committee appointment. So that would be good. Uh, Lorraine, did we get... Um, I know I saw a email from Mr. Taft answering the three questions at the school committee. I sent forward to you all. Okay. The answers, and I actually printed copies off of you. Oh. Thank you. For the next two months, Michelle, I'll give you a copy tonight. Right. Oh, that Thank just you. came in tonight. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Some I didn't get, so I mean, they all came in, but yeah. some I couldn't open. I had to have them sent. It was a little cumbersome, sorry to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're six thirty tomorrow, right? Not six. Six thirty. Senior center. Okay. Six thirty. Okay. All right. And, and are you doing the minutes for us tomorrow night? Is the, who's doing Thursday night? Do we have? You will. Are you sure? All right. Well, hopefully, the next the next meeting won't be quite as cumbersome to vote in terms of minutes. But how many interviews are we doing? Eight, each, three each four, night. Four, four each night. There's eight, four, eight candidates. Four, four, and four, then four. the and discussion. And then the vote. Yeah. Okay. So, and I my plan is not to have any discussion at all after the first night or the second night, and let the discussion happen on the fifteenth. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, Maura and I were talking about it earlier, and it seems like it might be worthwhile to ask everyone who's on the both committees to come to the next, to the third, the 15th meeting with rankings of their own as to who they, you know, number one, two, three, four. That's a good idea. And then I mean, can, if they want to send you the rankings in advance, I can have a great day up for you, if that's helpful. Is, is that legal? I don't know if that's allowed. They send it to her? Yes. Yes. So, but we could send them to you. They can go to Lorraine. She can't share them. She can compile it and then give it out the night of the meeting. Perfect. Okay. You can, you can talk with Lorraine about that. That's just a suggestion. No, let's. We're driving this train, so um, why don't we do it that way? 
and that way and you will. Date and you are. Right. Well, if we're. Yeah, I would say. Right. So I'm thinking if we tell people by Monday. Well, I'd push it even. I'd be even more aggressive. I'd say if the interviews are Wednesday, Thursday, by Monday morning, you should have been able to review your notes. Yeah, and send it to you, and then you can. Tomorrow, I can prepare a ranking sheet. That would be great. But I don't know. What do you want to rank? I mean, just your choices. Well, yeah, yeah. Because I think we don't have criteria to rank right now. No, we don't. There's no criteria. Just no. Using my well, I think you know when you talk to people, some people, something's more important than something else, and uh, so I wouldn't want to have to say to people, you have to rank them based on this. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, just like we did for DEI, really. You said this is my top person, and then right. we tracked. Okay, eight of you said this was your top person. Right. You know, seven of you said this was second. Five of you said this was third, et cetera, all the way down. Lorraine, when you do that, you know, there'll be like a name and then a box of ranking. Yeah. Can you leave a big thing on the right where you can write notes? Yes, for yourselves, yes. Yeah. Well, that's why I printed the answers to the questions, so you can put notes on that, too. Yes. Because you won't have a ranking thing by tomorrow. Right. Oh, we won't? I mean, I can try to help you tomorrow. Just joking. <laughs> keep, keep that patrol guy off the end. <laughs> I'll just take a nap all day. Is that what you do every day? Oh, take a long oh. one. Oh. Usually in the afternoon, but this one I'll take a morning one too. <laughs> so now that Tony's yawning, correspondence, please. Yes, book discussion at the Citra Town Library Wednesday, September 29th via Zoom, seven o'clock. Get there early. Reserve your spot. It's going to be awesome. It's all about climate change. It, there's a Elizabeth Rush is the author. Um, no, it's, it's a really good. Uh, I think they're doing more of these too. Uh, of the whole series on climate change, it's um, so definitely check that out, which is which is great. Uh, and then let's see, friends of Citrus Seniors build the campus. Reception, what is this? October 1st, 4 to 6, uh, right at the senior center. 4 o'clock. Uh, this, this is the dedication of the donor board and the room plaques. When's okay. that? October 1st. Okay. First. And then, last but certainly not least, residents should know that Cosmos Cafe, still on vacation. <laughs> so you can't get your extra crispy or, uh, pizza until <laughs> September 13th. Oh my so God. Stop, stop knocking on the door. <laughs> I think they leave the country, actually. Good for them. They deserve it. Yeah, they deserve it. Right. That's all I have. That's my... And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's an art walk down the harbor on Friday evening from, I think it's 5 to 9. And there will be a film crew in town uh, working on a uh, promotional film for the town. So get yourself down to the harbor. You might get into a picture or two. Bring photogenic children. Oh. Yeah. And new puppies? Puppies? Oh, no. Puppies? Uh-oh. Yeah, puppies. No, no, you'll right get in. It. <laughs> Anything else? I have one thing to add. Uh, Kim Stewart reminded me that this Friday night, the Citric Gridiron Club is organizing a USA night um, this Friday at the football game at Citrus High School at 6.30 p.m. They've uh, given a t-shirt giveaway, face painting, um, a flag tunnel for the players to run through, a reminder of the Chair of Honor, and a moment of silence for 9-11, and uh, the 13 services that were there, um, another one for that were recently killed in Afghanistan. So that benefit will go to the uh, Veterans Advisory Council. So oh, that's nice. good. this Friday night at the football game. Thank you for all those involved with that. Indeed. And just a quick reminder, we talked about this at the beginning. School starts tomorrow, people. The three of you that are watching right now, drive slowly. <laughs> or don't drive at all. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Do I have a motion to accept the minutes of August 24th? No. Yeah, that's fine. Right. So moved. Second. 
Second. Second by Ms. Curran. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I have to nothing. abstain. Oh, you weren't here. Okay. Three, nothing. Three, zero, one abstention. You might get it right. You just might want to change the word up to us, Lorraine, in the first sentence under town administrator. It's just a. I'm sorry, what is that? It says Henry thankfully missed up instead of missed us. Oh. Nothing big, nothing oh. huge and earth shattering. <laughs> it didn't mess up, it missed us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> One or the other. One or the other. He either missed. Do or I hear a motion to adjourn and sign? <laughs> so moved. Yeah. Second. <laughs> moved by Mr. Goodrich, second by Mr. Bagnani. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, it's 10:33. Good job. Bit.